Good evening. This is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Monday, <coughs> November the 11th at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Uh, in honor of Veterans Day, we would like to express our gratitude to all of the veterans in the District 58 community who have served their country in the armed for forces. We will now observe a moment of silence in their honor. Now, with all of our veterans in mind, we will proceed to the flag salute. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Highland School for leading us in the pledge, and now we'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Kraft, the principal of Highland. Welcome. Thank you uh, for having us tonight. Very excited to present to you some of the great things that we've been working on at Highland. Our student council officers will go first, and then you'll get a little bit of a taste of what life is like every day at Highland for me after that. So I'll introduce our student council officers. Stand, ladies. We have Caitlin Cutright, our president, Carol Ann Fiati, our vice president, Melina Kairoudis, our sixth grade secretary, and Lucia Wally, our fifth grade secretary. Student Council generates ideas and 
student finance poll. We then vote on the best item that benefits the students. This year we bought a new water bottle for the crown for Highland School at a cost of $1,100. During the school year, we want to continue the pen and pencil sales focused around the different seasons of the year. All of our students love to buy fun new school supplies. We also will continue spirit days and service projects. We want our school to be a fun, productive learning environment for our students so they will excel in the field. We want our students to come to us with new ideas for our school or if they ever need help with anything. We also try to have many fun events throughout the year. girls and a thank you uh, to Mrs. Varis and Mrs. Dunlap who are the sponsors of student council um, and now to give you a little bit of taste of what life every day um, is like at Highland when Christine and I sat down and kind of were thinking of how we wanted to present to you all tonight we thought of what better way than have our Highland Scoop team create a special edition for you the Highland Scoop is a completely student you know conceptualized produced and edited video that we watch every Friday instead of our morning announcements so we met with their production team told them what our vision was and they turned it into reality so this is the Highland Scoop special edition for tonight School Board, welcome to Highland School. My name is Robbie, and I'm a student of Miss Mabel's fifth grade class. My name is Alex, and I'm also a student, but I'm in Miss Varus's soaring sixth grade class. The Highland Scoop is a few-minute video that we make it that we play instead of the intercom. It, it tells the activities that are happening around our school. And now to Alex. Thanks, Robbie. And now let's see what Tia has to say about what is happening around this school's classroom this week. Hello, everybody. It's your reporter in the field, Tia, here today, and I'm with Ava. Hi. And we'll be talking about her Eclipse project in third grade. How's it going, Ava? It's good. Um, I really liked doing it. It was really fun, and we got to work on it a lot. And I am going to try it, because we're going to have to do this again to try to use different music for, yeah, I, we're going to do another one at the end of this unit. That sounds super cool. Again. And this time I'm with Henry. I'll also be talking about their third grade project. What do you like best about the project? I probably like choosing the music because you can like choose something that relates to your personality and everyone's music was different. That sounds like so much fun. I know I enjoyed it when I was younger. It's Tia here, and today I'm with Ava talking to her about the new global read aloud that we're reading in our classes. Let's get started. The first question I have for her is what does she think about the global read aloud so far? It's really fun, and it's where you Skype with another class, and the class that we're recently Skyping with is in Canada. Canada, that is so far away. Next question is, what's your favorite thing that you did in your together as a class? We played Heads Up, which is where they have a card and they put it above their head and we have to give them clues to guess the word. Wow, that is super cool. Hello everybody, I'm here with Reese today and he plays in band. Let's hear of what he has to say about it. First off, what's the instrument that you play? I play the trumpet. And what is your favorite song to play on the um, trumpet? I play Cardiff Castle with, at After School Band, and meeting everyone is great, and the whole band is in sync. Wow, that sounds really fun. Thank you, Tia, for telling us what's happening around Island. And now to Gigi. Hi, I'm Gigi, and this is Mr. Kraft, the principal here at Highland School, and I want to talk about the academic achievements. So how is Highland performing in the area of reading? 
That's a great question, Gigi. So on the spring 2019 MAP assessment in the area of reading, our median test percentile for Highland was 77.5%. What is our goal in the area of reading? So our district goal as it relates to our strategic plan is a median test percentile of 80%. And what are we going to do to meet the goal in reading? That's a really good question. So we're almost to our goal. We're just a few points shy of it. So we've sat down with our teachers to create a school improvement plan that focuses on student growth. We're going to take a look at how our teachers instruct our students. We're going to try out some new things and we're going to give teachers professional development on best practices in the area of reading. So let's talk about some math. Um, how is Highland performing in the area of math? So our median test percentile in the area of math is 68.6% on the spring 2019 MAP assessment. So what is our goal in the area of math? Our strategic plan's goal for the area of math as a district is to have a median test percentile of 77%. And how are we going to meet the goal in math? It's a great question. We definitely have some more work to do in math than we do in reading, uh, which is just okay. We also, on our part of our strategic plan is to also look at how we instruct in math. We're going to look at the curriculum we're using. We're going to look at different maybe instructional models and practices. And we're going to see what type of gaps our students might have and how we can better teach to a conceptual understanding and really focus it on student growth. Awesome. Thanks, Gigi, for talking to Mr. Kraft about map scores. And now to Kate for the joke of the day. This joke was submitted by Kate Hannum in Mrs. Nagel's fifth grade class. What do you call a heavy breathing bird? Hmm. A puffin. <laughs> I'm Gigi. This is Mrs. Kehoe, and she has been teaching for 25 years at Highland School. And why do you like to come to work every day? Well, my favorite part of coming to work is seeing all of the students here. Um, over the last few years, we've really been working on integrity, and the students are really working hard on doing the right thing, even though no one else is looking. So if you walk down the hall here, you'll see lots of students being busy and independent. Uh, while their teachers are working with another small group. This is Mrs. Scadio. She teaches fifth grade. And what do you think is the best part about Highland? Well, there's so many things that it's hard to choose just one. But I would have to say the community. The community in the school is fabulous. The teachers, the students, we are all really working together for our own benefit, plus the community outside of our school, the police department, the fire department, the public library, everyone who is involved in Downers Grove is fabulous. So I'd say that's my favorite part, the community. I'm Gigi, and this is Ms. Costello, who's a teacher who teaches fourth grade. What makes Highland School special? Highland School is special because of all the people in it. So the fabulous teachers and the staff and the fantastic students. You can always find someone to hang out with, so that's what makes it special. This is Ms. Priester, and she is the assistant principal at Highland School. What is our theme this year, and how do we make it happen? Thanks, Gigi. Our school theme this year is SOAR. It stands for showing respect, owning our actions, accepting differences, and realizing our potential. We work towards making great choices every day, so we are soaring through the school year. Thanks, Thanks for watching this special edition of the Highland Scoop. just so incredibly proud of what our students put together. Lucia is the director and she is responsible for all of that. So great job, Lucia. We're really proud of you. There's actually five production teams and with our teacher librarian, Angela um, Follier, they um, rotate through each week to put that on each Friday. Um, so we're very happy for her dedication at Highland. Um, I'd like to now introduce our PTA um, to share their fantastic contributions to Highland. We're really grateful for their partnership, ex especially in our first year. They've really, um, really made Highland feel like home. Thank you to the Board of Education for inviting us tonight. My name is Rachel Upton and I am the president of the Highland PTA. Joining me tonight from our executive board are Don Burroughs, our vice president, Amanda Wiley, our first vice president, 
and Jesse Warmbier, our secretary. This year we raised over $25,000 at our annual fun run in September, which allows us to implement some fun and educational programs at Highland. Some of these programs include One Book, One School. Thank you to Dr. Russell and Mr. Hughes for being guest readers this year. Our book, Finding Gobi, was a big hit among the students and staff. Geography Night, which will be held in March and alternates every other year with Math and Science Night, K-2 through Reading Night, Partners in Art, and Birthday Books. We are also very excited to be bringing four authors to Highland during Author Fest. The PTA continues to support our school by providing assemblies and assisting with field trip costs for all students. Last year, the PTA awarded three grants to Highland teachers for books for a new third grade classroom, an iPad station for one of our second grade teachers, and finally, we purchased the components for a new sensory path that was installed to aid our resource teachers. We also celebrate American Education Week every year by giving monetary stipends to both full and part-time teachers. The PTA sponsors many events to increase family involvement and help strengthen our school community, including family bingo night, holiday shop, family roller skating at the Lombard Roller Rink in February, and family movie night. I also wanted to give you an update on Climb Higher at Highland. A little over a year ago, I stood before you with a request to fundraise for a new playground at Highland. <clears throat> we held our first fundraiser just before Halloween last year. Today, we have raised nearly $78,000. We hosted the inaugural Husky Hustle last May, which raised over $18,000. We've had some great fundraisers along the way, including Dine Out Nights, and we are currently getting the students involved by holding a Pennyworth competition. The winning grade will receive a fun prize. In October, we hosted a raffle and silent auction called the Swings and Slides Soiree, which generated over $23,000. We have already begun working on our next Husky Hustle. We are so pleased with our progress so far, and hopefully we will see some of you doing the hustle in May. Thank you again for allowing us to participate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for Thank letting you. us give you a peek into what high life is like at Highland every day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you good. very much. Thank you. All right, uh, we could have the members of the student council come up. We would love to get a photograph with you. Yeah, we do. That is so cute. I want to know how they got the desk. Uh, the desk. Yeah. It's got to be amazing. Yeah. 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 Future broadcasters. I was going to say, definitely. I mean, who's over the right group, right? I had a friend from high school who's on WGN News now. Like, crazy. <laughs> Every time I watch news, I'm like, so fast. Yeah. <laughs> The interviewer, the, on the, the reporter on the street. Oh, yeah. so this time, kind of uh, piggybacking off on the presentation we just saw, the board would like to recognize all the students in District 58 who are elected or volunteered to serve on their school's student council. We are very proud of their dedication to service and leadership. With that, we're going to move on to our first non-action report, which is a spotlight on our schools, the school report card with uh, Dr. Uh, Justin Sissel, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction. Thank you. 
we're looking forward tonight to having a chance to review the much of the data that's found in the uh, 2019 district report card. Um, we're going to take a look at a, a high-level overview of that data. I think we, we have to acknowledge that the district report card is 40 pages long, and each individual school's report card is about 18 to 20. So it would, we could take hours to go through every metric there, but we're going to try to get through the things that we, we want to focus on that, that relate first and foremost to our key performance indicators. We're going to spend some time talking about those specific ESSA designations, and then we'll take a look at some of the additional and some of the newer data that's contained in the district report card. And then finally, toward the end of the presentation, Presentation. We're going to spend some time talking about what does this mean for us? What can the data tell us? What do we actually do and, and, and what are the next steps? And so this is a quote that I, I like to use whenever we're talking data because it really, what matters is what we glean from the data and what insight it can give us about our systems and our, and, and our, our children's education. So when we look at the school report card, uh, or the district report card, but they're all termed as school, there are three unique presentations that the state provides for us. The first is um, the most robust and interactive, and it's called the Illinois Interactive Report Card. So for those of us who would want to really spend time researching and digging into each individual school and, and just a, a wealth of data that is provided by the state and some that's provided by the district, you can navigate to IllinoisReportCard.com and enter any individual school or the district and really see a, a lot of, of summary information as well as some very specific information. Then there's the district at a glance report card, which is a two page summary provided by that same website. So kind of a, a downloadable, almost a, a glossy type thing, if you will, that gives some summary. And one of the reasons I wanna highlight these unique presentations is I want you to take a look at that ELA proficiency. Let's see if my thing is gonna to work tonight. That ELA proficiency number, right? So on the two pager, it's 50%, it, it, it shows as our district's measurement. Another view is what we call the classic report card view, which is that static PDF that's generated once by the state. And this is the one that we do publish on our website. If we look at ELA proficiency on this reporting mechanism, you'll see that the number there is 49.3%, which doesn't actually round to 50, right? And so it's one of those interesting discrepancies right away. Another thing that we look at is the actual summary of, the, of each student's assessment score from the Illinois Assessment of Readiness that's provided to us through the website. And this is a busy slide that walks its way through showing another measurement that says 49, on the ELA side, 49.5% of our students met or exceeded standards based on their criteria. And I, I highlight all of that just because we've had a lot of conversations as an administrative team about attention to precision and detail when we're reporting these kinds of numbers. You know, there's, there's also a, a margin of error within any data set to be sure, and I think these numbers are probably well within that margin, but when we start talking about key performance indicators, our, our percentages are, are, are tight and, and, and ambitious, and so each of those numbers can matter, and we just want to make sure that we are consistent in the way that we're presenting data. So to that end, these are the numbers that we've used as we report out our district measurements and, and the KPIs. You're not going to, again, not drastic differences, but if there ever were a question as to where exactly are we pulling those numbers, this is the, the internal calculation that happens, which is very close to both the state presentations. So we'll start by talking about reading and math proficiency, which again is primarily um, derived from students who achieve a level four or a level five out of five possible levels on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, which was formerly the Park Assessment. So when we look at our district scores, First, I'll draw your attention, it's the bottom, the second row from the bottom that's bolded is our district um, average across the board. And I think the thing that this slide highlights most for me is the distance from this column over here, these columns over here, where we saw a 91.6% participation rate and proficiency scores in the 30s, to over here, where we can now see a 98% participation rate and, and a gain in, a, in achievement of over 10% of our student population over the course of two years. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to recognize. It, it was just under two years ago that I stood before then, the, the then Board of Education, which many of you were, were at the table, and asked if we could take a look at the way we were approaching this assessment as a district. Um, prior to that moment, we had, we had really stated that we weren't going to use this assessment for instructional decision making, and we were a little more relaxed in our approach toward it. We certainly met the state requirements, but it wasn't with the same um, 
intensity that we looked at some of our other assessments. And so through conversations with the board, with the administrative team, and certainly with all of our teachers and our community at large, we spent the larger part of that next six months reframing the conversation in our community around the then park assessment, which is now the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. And so we have the spring of 18 data and the spring of 19 data with that revised approach with that lens of right-sizing our approach to the assessment, not giving it undue weight, but recognizing that this is an accountability measure that isn't going anywhere and that we have a responsibility to. So I think that's the, that's the highlight from, from this trend is, is that upward growth. <coughs> Obviously, you can see from 17 to 18, we saw a much more significant uh, gain in achievement than we did from 18 to 19. So that's another piece of the conversation. So this is actually our first chance then to apply these numbers to our key performance indicators. So the third and fourth key performance indicators from our strategic plan relate to our Illinois Assessment of Readiness proficiency. And our overall target is that by the spring of 2021, we'll see 60% of our students achieve proficiency in both reading and math on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. We set sort of incremental targets to keep ourselves on track. And again, with, with reading, we're, we're just about right there at that 49.5% or 50 if you take the one at a glance. With math, we're a percentage point or two under at this point. We also know that we're in the midst of a math pilot and, and we'll talk more about how that has an impact on our hopeful continued uh, forward trend. But again, we're still seeing even incre incremental growth from where we were in 2018 to now. So it's always a strange thing to have to talk about a, a spring data point in November, but that is, that is uh, where, where we are from the state. We don't really, we weren't allowed to share it with you until this point, or I guess a few days ago. So then the next slide is really, again, very difficult to see, but out there for, for the, <laughs> the public record in the sense that it's the first time we've been able to display our entire spring 2019 data set of all six key performance indicators. Again, the third and fourth are new information tonight. One, two, five, and six we've discussed at previous board meetings. We talk a lot, and, and ESSA talks a lot, about considering growth and achievement next to each other. And it is only very recently that, we've, that the state has chosen to do growth calculations around the state mandated assessments. And so for the first time, we're presenting the sort of the proficiency and the growth side by side, again, specifically around the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. So this slide shows us that as a district where we're seeing 49.5 and 48.2% proficiency in ELA and math respectively. We're seeing 52.5 and 56.5 growth percentiles respectively. That growth is truly normed at 50, so again, similar to when we talk about math, everything above the 50th percentile is, is good news for us. The state average is 50, and so again, we can see numbers that, that range a little bit, and we'll talk about those ranges in subsequent slides, but just to, to keep in mind that whenever we're, you know, we are, a high-performing district, and so it's important for us to look at proficiency, but it's also important for us to think about where our high-achieving students, and, and all of our students, are going from year to year. And so that's why putting these two measurements side by side will be something we'll continue to look at. Another thing that we haven't done until this slide deck in, in terms of presentations of the data is to really start to think about how do we compare to the districts around us. And so as a first um, attempt at sharing that measurement, we took a look at the, the school report cards for the districts that, that feed into District 99 as well as District 99 itself. And so when we, when we just summarize this slide, most of our percentiles are, are pretty well in the center of the pack across the board. We, we've got some higher end achievement in science compared to our, our, the comparable districts around us. And there are some districts who are doing some things that are, are realizing a little more growth in some areas or a little, a little higher achievement proficiency rates in some areas. Um, again, when we look to where we're at compared to the high school, we can, we can look, those aren't apples to apples because it's the IAR versus the SAT, but just to start to, to bring that into our consciousness a little bit of how are we, how are we comparing to the districts that we might compare ourselves to. So I'm going to go into the ESSA designations just a bit. And um, again, we spent a lot of time at the curriculum workshop going over how these are arrived at. Each school receives a designation based on its, a, a number of calculations. Again, as a reminder, a tier one school has no underperforming subgroups, and their performance is in the top 10% of schools in that given year in the state. A commendable school has the same designation, but not the top 10%. And then a, a tier four school is the lowest performing 5%. 
And then finally, that tier three school says that um, any of the other things can be true in tier one or two, but there would be a subgroup of students who are performing at that lowest 5% level. Again, when we talk about subgroups, these are the demographic groups that ESSA um, identifies for subgroups. Uh, if there are 20 or more students in a given school that fall into one of these categories and have five or more data points within the ESSA pie chart that we'll see in just a minute, then they are designated as subgroups. So one of the things we're talking about at individual schools as we're going over school data is that demographically, we have many more subgroups at our schools than ESSA calculates for us because we may, we, we may not, at an elementary school for example, we may have 30 students that fit one of those categories K6, but they may not be 3-6, so they may not have those data points from the state assessment. So that's one of the things that we look at in terms of ESSA subgroups versus actual demographics at the individual schools. And again, just as a reminder, this is how those ratings are calculated. So 50% of the pie for ESSA is growth. Again, that's the numbers we saw based upon the performance on the IAR from year to year. And again, just as a reminder, that measures students who began at a certain place in last year's IAR against all the other students who began at that place. They calculate an average growth percentile for each school and then the district based upon the calculation of each individual student's growth percentile. 25% is achievement, That's the, those are the, the thin colored slices, proficiency in math, ELA, and science. And then that English learner progress to proficiency statistic, again, it appears when we have that subgroup in a school. So most of our, for the majority of our schools, we, we do not have that subgroup indicator for this year. And then finally, 25% is the school quality indicators. So this year, that includes chronic absenteeism and whether or not students participated in the climate surveys. So these are our designations as a district. We're incredibly proud of all 13 of our schools. This year we see seven of our schools designated as exemplary and the remaining six designated as commendable. And that's a, that's a tremendous source of pride for us in many ways because it tells us that we are attending well to all of our students who may be in at-risk categories because none of our subgroups have been designated as underperforming. It also tells us that you know, when we know historically where we've been, last year we saw 11 schools exemplary and two commendable, those, those numbers can shift year to year. And when you see the ranges in a, in a couple of slides, you'll see that you know, there, we, we do have some wider ranges as a district, but we, we also know that we are on the higher end of commendable in most cases as well. That's, you know, it's something that's worth thinking about. 75% of the schools in the state are designated commendable. And what ESSA doesn't do, it draws this relatively arbitrary top 10% line, but there's no other deline delineation for the remainder of that. And so it becomes one of those things where we need to be careful that that designation between tier one and tier two, it's exciting to, to look at that, but it also is a, it's a moving target from year to year. And so I think when we focus on this, we want to recognize the designations and, and, and see that as a point of pride, but we really want to spend more time looking at the numbers behind those designations to make sure that each one of those 13 schools is working toward increased gains in achievement and greater growth in each given year. Just as a sample so we can see how this all works out, these are the reports that each individual school um, are, are given by the state. And so this is the information at each of those individual parent forums that we're walking through in great detail for each school. And so this shows the top row where it says raw calculation. That's all the raw data that we looked at from the school report card and those, and those numbers that would be there. So we looked at district numbers, but this is Henry Puffer's actual calculation slide. And then that bottom row where it says weighted index, that's where the, the numbers are taken from raw data and turned into essentially points out of 100 so that we can get to that, that rating and rank. So this slide kind of shows where points are possible in that bottom row. So for each school, when we look at it, we can see how close are we to, to essentially full credit in the ESSA designation. And then at the very far uh, right is the summative score. And so this year, when we go through all those calculations, as an example for Henry Puffer, that summative score is 80.78. This year, when the state drew the line, the cutoff for exemplary is 80.12. And so that is um, where Henry Puffer's designation comes from being above 80.12. When we look at all of that data for each of the 13 schools, these are, again, sort of those total possible points um, in terms of the, the raw data numbers and then where we fell across the district. So this is one of those places where we can see that we certainly, we have some, we have some wider ranges uh, among the schools. So you can see the difference between the ESSA target of 46.38 in ELA proficiency, for example. Our highest achieving school in proficiency this year had 63% of students um, meeting or exceeding expectations. And 
we had one school that had 34% of students meeting or exceeding expectations. So these are the kinds of things that ESSA is actually designed to ask us to do. The, the idea of, of looking at individual schools and the subgroups within those schools is exactly the point of this legislation to ensure that we're, we're taking the time to think about where the spaces are between our schools and making sure that we're looking at things equitably. Again, when we, when we look at each school, we look at proficiency and growth and all of those things <coughs> side by side. In the end, our summative total range is from 87.32 down to 62.43. So a little bit of a, a little bit of a step down from that exemplary cutoff, certainly. But also we know that it, it really does go down to you know the the, the 20s and, and, and teens across the state. So still very much points of pride on that summative total. There are some new pieces that um, I alluded to at the curriculum workshop that I want to just take a moment again to, to, to talk about as they are part of the report card. The first is um, newly reported this year, which are the site-based expenditures. Again, that's intended to demonstrate or to ensure that funds are spent equitably across schools within a district. So there are certain costs that are centralized across all of the schools, um, and then there are certain costs that are building specific. So one of those, those biggest building specific costs is the salary and benefit cost. We know that as a school district, uh, that makes up the bulk of our budget as it is. So as an example, the salaries of the central office administration are, are applied equally to every school, but the salaries of the individual staff at every given building are applied specifically to that school. So we do see a district average of $14,373 per pupil and a range um, that again takes into account some of those differences. And so that's illustrated by this chart that just kind of shows us that average line and where each school is as it relates to the average. And so you can see that we're, while there is a range, we're seeing a relatively equitable distribution. That far right um, column that goes all the way far above the district average, those are the students who are outplaced from the district and are in private programs that typically include tuition costs and additional transportation costs. And so that just is a difference from the students who are in our 13 buildings. Another new piece on the school report card is the civil rights data collection. Um, so if you look carefully at the top, this is data from the 16-17 school year, as it turns out. And really, this looks specifically at um, the behavioral data, the, our, the, our suspension percentage, our expulsion percentage, um, and, and things of, of that nature. And so as you look across, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we're seeing ourselves far below the state averages across the board and, and with zeros in many of the, of the more significant um, data points that, that could occur. So that's another piece of our district report card. The last seven or eight pages really focus on the, the services and targets provided for students who have um, IEPs and are involved in our special education program. And so just as, a, as a, the first slide that comes up in, or the first page rather, that comes up in the district report card focuses on the percentages of students with IEPs and, and what their educational environments are. And so again, this is a place where the further we are to the left, where we're seeing students that are inside their general education setting greater than 80% of the time, who are also receiving special education services, we're, we're, we're proud of the fact that that number is above our peer district comparisons and well above the state average. And then as we continue to move toward the right into more restrictive environments, we're happy to see that our, our percentages are lower across the board than what we're seeing in the state. So again, that's a an admittedly high level summary of the school report card and the district report card data. So the question is what do we do with all that information? What are our next steps? And so the question we have to ask is what can we learn from this data? And I think one of the first things we can point out is, is as I did, we've seen a tremendous increase in achievement over the past two years. I mean, that's a really exciting number for us. And yet, our strategic plan goals ask us to continue on that trajectory and essentially double that two-year achievement in the next gain in the next two years. And so that means that we have to continue to acknowledge that we are responsible to this assessment and think about how we can best prepare our students to meet those targets. And so there are three pieces that we're talking about across the district. The first two have been, have been part of our conversation for the past two years. The, this is a, a, an assessment platform that students don't see every day. So we need to ensure that it's not a novel experience when they log on to that assessment. We're working to make sure that there's an opportunity for them to practice the, the, the reading of practice questions, the input of, sample of their sample responses to make sure it's familiar. 
our approach, as I mentioned, we really want to make sure that we are not suggesting that we will endure this together, though we may feel that way deep down sometimes. The reality is that, this is, that these state mandates have been around for a long time and will be around for a long time, and the assessment itself doesn't ask our students to do anything that is inappropriate or evil. It asks for some very specific demonstrations of knowledge. And so we want to stay positive. We want to approach it with, with thoughtful energy when we, when, from all the way from district administration to down to classroom teacher on the, the moorings of proctoring those assessments. The more specific target this year, though, is to really think about how our daily and weekly assessment practices are reflected in the kinds of assessment that, in the kinds of questions that the IAR is asking for us. And so that, that question I, I phrased a few different ways is really, how often are we asking our students to demonstrate their knowledge in the same way that this assessment asks them to articulate their knowledge? And we've, we've spent specifically last Monday and this Monday across the district um, in our professional learning time at, at, during the early release, giving teachers time to really dig into those questions specifically, to have the moments to look as grade level clusters at what do those questions look like and how are they similar or different than what we currently ask. Um, and, and that really is something that we haven't necessarily taken the time to dig specifically into. And so I, I think that some of the, the realizations and the conversations I've heard as our teachers have been going through that process is this is this is challenging. And a lot of these questions are multi-step where the second step relies on the first. And a lot of the, there's a lot of requiring the ability to construct an argument or to critique someone else's reasoning. Why was this solution incorrect? And while we do that really well, I think, verbally in a lot of our classrooms, the, the question we're starting to ask is how often do we ask the students to commit that to writing? And, and how often should we? You know, again, it's a right-sized approach, but the more we can integrate those kinds of those kinds of assessment questions into our daily and weekly practice, um, the better off we're going to be when we are asked in these high stakes moments to display our knowledge in that way. And so we began with district directed learning in these past two Mondays and then it, it is sort of it becomes a handoff to the building level to continue those conversations and looking at all of this data in a, in a, a number of different ways. Another acknowledgement as we talked about how when those assessment questions appear is that our new reading curricula series, the assessments align pretty well to the kinds of questions that are being asked. And so we, the more we use those, the more comfortable our teachers are with those materials. Sometimes it's a, it's a reality check for me that we're really only in the second full year of implementation. I feel like we've been talking about benchmark and study sync forever, but this is truly year two for most teachers. And so we're still becoming more comfortable and more confident and, and, and better at using those assessments. So it's nice to see those acknowledgments that we do, we, we more and more have the tools and we are now able to take the time through professional learning to really integrate them. We also, again, started tonight to talk about comparisons and one of the things you do when you compare is you say, well, what, what are they doing over there that, that we could learn from? And so we've got some natural opportunities that we're already engaged in. Through DuPage County, we're really very fortunate through the Regional Office of Education that there's a network for curriculum directors, there's a network for instructional coaches, there's a special education network. Most of us at the central office attend county meetings across the year and it's, it's, a, it's a great networking opportunity and a chance to sit down next to someone and say, all right, tell me about how you're, how you're doing this informally, and then also to look formally at some specific um, exemplar districts and really think about you know, what, what steps have they taken that we have or haven't, and what are some of those differences. So it's, it's, a, it's admittedly a, a newer exploration for us to focus, again, to focus on this assessment is a newer piece for all of us, but using these networking opportunities really do provide additional opportunities for district-wide growth. Another question, another thing we need to acknowledge with this specific data is that we have 13 neighborhood schools, I mean 11 neighborhood elementaries and two larger neighborhood middle schools, and, and we're proud of the individuality of each of those communities, and yet we have to acknowledge there's a wide range of, of data when we look at specifically the state data across spring 2019, there, those ranges are significant. And it's a fair question to wonder why we have a, a, a 25 point or a 30 point difference between some of our schools when we're looking at certain metrics. And so that is something that we, you know, again, that ESSA asks us to look at. And so from a district perspective, we really need to think about what are we providing to, or, or what are we working to provide to ensure that each school has equitable and consistent access. And you'll, you'll hear those phrases through many presentations throughout the years. There are specific strategic plan councils that focus on this idea. 
one of the things that, that we know is that we are in a, a process of ensuring consistent curricular resources that are, that are robust and rigorous and available for everyone. You know, saying that we're in the second year of a new ELA adoption, we have to remember that that means we're only three or four years out from an era where teachers were empowered to use the materials they felt best to teach the standards. And while that empowerment is exciting, what we learn as a district is that it's also, it, it also isn't necessarily fair to teachers to not give them that core foundation from which to base their instruction so that they can then supplement as individuals and, and make all kinds of professional decisions. And so that's, a, that's an important step that we're taking. So as our math committee is working diligently toward a, a, a hopeful recommendation for a new resource, that's again something we'll see hopefully implemented in the fall that will provide that opportunity for all of our students in math just as it has in reading. And, and those things take time to implement across a large system. I mean, that's again, it's, it's, we spend so much time talking and thinking about it, but it does take time to see the impact of those systematic changes. And that's where that increase of professional learning time is so critical because it's one of the, it's, it's perhaps the thing that's allowing us to see these curricular implementations and new adoptions done with fidelity and, and giving teachers time to, to take a step back and process through and learn from each other and have specific training around how to keep working through that. That consistency of resources also helps us to give our administrators consistent lenses for expectation. When, you, when, when we can say these are the kinds of things you should be seeing in every reading classroom because we have these consistent resources, that helps all of us to feel accountable on one hand but well supported on the other hand. I think that's the important piece there. And you'll see in each slide, we, 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 need to, we want to be looking forward toward continuous improvement always. But I also want to be very careful to say our teachers have been working incredibly hard for, for decades. And, and as we provide them with new resources, we're excited to see an increase in, in rigor that we're all acknowledging as, things are, are, as our expectations from our, for our students are increasing with what we're seeing they're able to do. The, the number of conversations around second graders annotating text is, is, makes me smile across the district because that's not something we would have thought was a, a, a necessary skill at that grade level before. And now we're seeing it increase as we go forward. As it goes down to the building level, we still want to learn from each other as buildings. Just as I talked about looking at exemplar districts, our administrative team is wonderfully collaborative. And so we are carving out time at administrator meetings to talk about the way things are being implemented, the kinds of strategies and programs and supports that are, that are there. Because a lot of that has grown from those individual unique student populations. There will always be building level decision making around the way we want to allocate some of those district provided resources and the way we want to, and even the professional learning at the building level that individual teachers need. You know, Our job at the district is to ensure that everyone has that baseline, but as a, as a building principal I can see the need to differentiate even more specifically and, and help some of my teachers who are still you know, in the learning process really have the opportunity to take the time to do that. And so we're able to learn from each other as buildings. The other piece that happens at the building level, but is also a district responsibility, is the school improvement planning process. And this is something that we, we talked about again at the curriculum workshop. We've seen our school improvement plans, and I think our, our school teams have done a wonderful job looking at the data that they have and acknowledging some points to improve and work toward. I think the other thing that we're talking through as an administrative team is that that process can always become more robust. And I think one of the next steps that we want to take as a district is to really think about not necessarily the way that we are setting the target and the way that we're analyzing the data at the end, but the questions we're asking to get to that point, the, the assessment we're doing of our school systems individually, of our, of our growth data, of our achievement data, of our structures within the school. And I think that's something that we you will continue to hear um, over the next year, talk about reflection and revision to that process to make sure that, again, it, it does everything we need it to do now that we have additional data that we can trust its validity. You know, we have two years of state assessment data with an approach that says we value this. And so it's, it's now our time to acknowledge that we, we are no longer able to say, well, we didn't pay attention to this assessment or any of those kinds of things. It's now time to, to own that data and look forward to how we can continue to see the numbers go in the direction that we want them to and to, to see how we can bring those gaps or those distances from our district average much closer to the, to the high side of average as we go forward. The last point I'll make in, in the slides, and then I'm sure, I, I, I imagine there may be questions because there's a lot of information here. 
at the end of the day, we've spent a lot of time tonight talking about one very specific measurement, and, and it's, it's appropriate for us to do that. It's, it's how we're held accountable to the state and by our community at large. It's the one measurement that exists across Illinois. So we do want to make sure that we, we, we pay it its due. But that information is one, one data capture of a group of students at one point in time. And so as we tell the stories of each of our schools and, and of growth and achievement, we have to be careful to, to, to right size the weight that this data gets against everything else we know and report about our, our, our students. And that's, that's good and bad. It's not to say that we want to add other things to, 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 to change the narrative. We want to make sure the narrative is complete and accurate all of the time. And, and as we go through the individual school forms, where we really go a little more specifically into the school level data, each principal is also sharing both ways we support our students when we recognize the needs, and things that we're incredibly proud of about our schools that may or may not directly relate to growth and achievement data, but, but certainly are contributing factors to those things. So, with that, um, that's the last presentation slide I have. I'll, I'll pause now for any questions you may have. And just before we get to board questions, I, I just want to personally thank Mr. Sissel for not only this presentation tonight, but for those of you who don't know, he's replicating this with every building uh, across all 13 schools. I think he's worked 15 hour days for, well, for who knows how long. So thank you for all of your efforts to bring this to our community. It's much appreciated. <coughs> I have no questions, I just have some comments. Okay. Um, so, um, thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much for putting that together, Justin. I really appreciate all your hard work. Um, surely you, this, this, you, you do always do a great job of, of um, presenting this information in a way that's accessible and um, thoughtful, and it's very much appreciated. A um, couple of comments, um, just, just big picture things. Um, Dr. Russell and I were talking before the meeting, and I'm just looking back to some of the, the, the um, how can the district respond and interpret the data and some of the things you mentioned there I'm just seeing if I can fi find that slide um, the district focal points we talked about like you know having a can-do approach um, a deliberate and, and cur uh, look at our current approach and assessment I'm thinking along the lines of what we just need to make sure we're doing and this is really related in part to my question at the last workshop we I just I just asked something like who's doing the, the school improvement work I just think that we just, as a district, we need to be having a uniform process for continuous improvement. So what's going on at, at Highland is the same as what's going on at, at El Sierra from north to south, east to west. Um, I think um, some of the things that we need to be talking about, and I really like how you phrased it, um, you know, what is this, you know, we, I don't want to perseverate on the labels of exemplary or commendable or, or underperforming or lowest performing. I, I really want to dig into the data and I want all the teams um, to be doing that. Not just, not just limited to the administrative team, but making sure there are teams of teachers and other staff members in the building who are, who are coming with this data. Um, I, I really like how you present it to us. I, I'm looking back at the, the Henry Puffer information. Um, again, I don't want to perseverate on the labels, however, it should be noted to everybody at Henry Puffer that they, they just missed, or excuse me, they, they just got into exemplary. They were a, a few tenths of their points off. It's a celebration, but they should be looking for opportunities to make sure that they're growing. And so, I mean, again, just having a very limited amount of information here, I see math growth. That's, that's their greatest area of need in terms of, of what this data reveals to us at a very macro level of, of where they should be digging in. So I would just be hoping that all of our, our, our buildings are, are really digging in and um, you know, I, I gotta say, I, I loved the Highland presentation night. I thought it was awesome. And what you guys did that I haven't seen before is you talked, I mean, it was, it was kid friendly, but you guys talked about your, your data and you talked about what you're doing as, as a building to respond to it. That is, that is tremendous. And I, would, I, I, I welcome more of that. And I, I would actually welcome more minutia than, than you're giving us, but I think we can all handle that. Um, obviously, it's, you're not going to talk to a third or fourth grader about all the different things you're doing with professional learning and, and curriculum, but we'd love to hear that as a board. I, I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody. Um, last but not least, um, just want to make sure, um, I don't think this is specifically directed, or if it was, I apologize, just want to make sure we're looking at subgroups. Um, you know, one of our buildings was their, their overall weighted index was 62.43. I'm curious as a, as a board member, but also as a member of the community, as, 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 a, as a parent would be, how are our subgroups in that building, and, and all buildings really, how are they all performing? 
um, if we have, if the all group is at 62.43, where are our CWD, our, our children with disabilities? Where are our Latino students? Where are our free and reduced lunch students? Um, again, digging into the data, um, not just identifying um, a curricular need like math growth, but hey, here's, some, here's a group of kids that are potentially not getting the, the focus that we need. Um, so just my thoughts, great presentation. Um, we, oh, there's a lot to celebrate, and I just want to make sure that we have that, that mentality, that culture of continuous improvement. No, I, I really appreciate that, and, and, and generally on continuous improvement, yes, it's, it's something we're continuing to talk about. The, the beginning of going, I mean, we, we also spent two administrative meetings digging into all of this so that our, our principal team could become more comfortable with this, and I, I can tell you I'm getting more requests for, can you pull this report for me so I can go over it at the faculty meeting, can you pull some additional, can we frame it this way, than, than we have in the past. Again, if we go back seven, eight years when it was ISAT, we all did a lot of item analysis and spent time with that. We are, we are reframing the district culture around this assessment, and, and so I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see our principal team taking it back to the building level and really doing that. It's a cultural shift, and we're not going to be able to, to flip a switch today and just say, hey, this is, this is the new way we're going to be approaching data. But we need to be aspiring to alignment from the boardroom to the classroom, where every every group, every stakeholder group is is united in this idea that we are going to be teams improving every year. Uh, the board is talking about it, central office, administrative teams, and teams of teachers, and even down to kids, just talking about, hey, here's my goals for the year, and here's how I can get better, and here's what I'm going to do. Thanks, most of. Are you are you, are you are you saying that like? For um, where there's growth opportunities, that it's about like looking at it as we're going to get behind this test. Is that are you saying that you don't think that that's uniform across the board? I'm not. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, do you understand what I'm asking? Not exactly. <laughs> I, I, I think are I'm, you? Do you understand? Yeah. I'm saying like, are you saying that you don't think that uniformly everyone is embracing this new? No, I'm just. I, I like think that, that, that we as a district just need to be constantly improving in terms of you know whether the test is the IAR or the park or MAP or whatever indicate whatever measure you choose, we we as the board need to ex need, you know we expect accountability to to the, the instruction. So we have to expect we are expecting high results and we um, you know there's there's a lot of celebrations in this data, but there's also a lot of opportunities. And so we just need to be making sure from this level that we are pushing the system forward. Yeah, I, I think from a state level, with the state assessment, because it's changed so frequently, there was almost an attitude across the state of Illinois is this too shall pass. And sometimes that even can permeate itself into school districts. In, in Downers Grove in particular, in some other communities where you had a large number of people opt out, and then the district even, you know, basically stating that we're not going to even look at this assessment or any of those types of things. Um, that has changed, but sometimes those habits are, are hard to break. And so how are we as a district keeping that balance of still making sure that we give our teachers autonomy, that we still allow them to not teach to the test, but yet prepare our students in a manner that they can handle anything that gets put in front of them. Um, I don't think any of us are ever advocating for teaching to the test. We want to make sure, though, that we prepare our students for those challenging questions, that rigor, based on those set of standards. You know, as Justin alluded to, the new ELA curriculum being based off of what students may encounter. Um, I don't necessarily think that everything we did in a school district, or in this district and many others, had that particular lens. So yes, I, I think more actively proctoring, paying closer attention to this test, looking at these in greater detail, is a culture shift for our school district. Not that we were flat out ignoring this assessment, but now really diving in deeper from the board level all the way down to the, the, the classroom level. I don't know if that answered your question, Tracy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, because there are some, some definite areas where there's disparate. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And so I'm just, I, but that, so you're not like suggesting that it's because of the mentality behind no, it? No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, no. Sure no, I, 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 have, I have full faith I, in all of our families, <laughs> all of our teachers, all of our, all of our administration. I just, you know, we, we need to just, we want all of our kids up here, you know, that's, that's, that's the goal. And whatever, we just need to keep uh, making adjustments and, and progress monitoring and making sure that we have um, the structures in place to make sure that we get there. 
I, I think too, one of the hardest things about um, assessment, and we've spoken, you know, all of us as individuals and then as a whole as well, is it's so hard to put your finger on why exactly are the scores where they're at. It's also very hard to put your finger on if we just do this, then these scores will, will shoot up. But we know that several things will help us get closer to that. One, I, I think that we're talking about here is just the efficacy behind um, all of us who are administering this test. How seriously are we taking it? Are we actively proctoring? You know, all, all of those things. Um, but certainly that's not the only reason why we would see scores that are, are ranging in, in different ways. Um, there, are, there are several reasons why you would see um, scores ranging in different ways. But how we treat the test is, is an important first step in getting to higher growth and in, in higher achievement. Um, another big piece in my view is a, a consistent and reliable curriculum across the board. I think that is such an important piece so our teachers are all on the same page when they get together and they collaborate that they know exactly what one another are doing and how they can work off each other but still allowing them to have that autonomy to provide those engaging lessons. Um, then the school improvement process. One of the things that we have to make sure that we do is continue this model of continuous improvement. I know that doesn't make sense to say that twice in the same sentence. but. Um, how do we allow our teachers to understand this data because it is so overwhelming in, in 75 different ways you can hand them reports. How do we get that down to the classroom level so that they can make individual decisions for their individual students because that is where the rubber meets the road. That's where kids grow when their classroom teacher has a system that they can get behind. And in, in, not that we're not looking at the school improvement process. I've been very impressed with just the initial steps that we've taken this year. But to have that uniform process throughout all of our schools is something that Justin and I are working very hard on with the rest of our administrative team and, and we will have a full-blown recommendation for what that's going to look like for next year and beyond in the coming months. And, and, and for each building as well, not just like a holistic, not across as a district, but no, so literally myopically like this building. Absolutely. Right down to, so we'll set up the, the, the process and parameters. So this is what school improvement looks like in the continuous improvement cycle in District 58 based on research that works. Now what those individual plans look like in different buildings are going to be different not only by buildings, but by individual grade levels and, and really individual classrooms because that's how it has to look because what you know Henry Puffer may need to work on may not be the same thing right. that El Sierra needs to work on. As Jason pointed out, we have neighborhood schools and uh, the other thing too is the more uniform that system is, I know several of us have talked about studying pockets of success where are we seeing it working in our school district and how do we get those teachers together so we can continue to learn and grow from each other. Um, I, I think that is such an important piece of this new system and, and one of the things that I want to thank the board is early release gives us a model to do more of that. Um, today I was in a meeting with our um, middle school math teachers from both schools and they were talking about practices in their classroom. Before this year that really couldn't happen and so that is a very nice piece uh, that we've implemented this year but the plans have to look different in each building and they also have to look different year after year because when you get data in you need to then adjust what you're doing. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. So as part of the school improvement plan is and this is just a, a thought or I don't know um, but if there are schools where it's more than one sub and I don't like Justin and I have talked at length about <laughs> subgroups and I'm not a fan of them, but um, being able to provide the schools that need more intervention, so maybe it's an extra resource teacher in math or something, but then that goes to budget, and then that makes things maybe not equitable as far as the school buildings, but is that... No, it's still equitable. It's still equitable, right? It's so you're providing the, need, the needs the need where, the, where the, the needs are. I mean, you're, need, you're providing the, the resources to where we have the needs. That's right. I think there's two ways to look at this, and, and Justin, feel free to jump in as well. One of the things that I commend the district this year, for for instance, they've taken a look at, um, you know, where can we spend our Title I dollars for if we have higher concentrations of students in poverty? Is there a way to offer those buildings more staff? And we've done that with, uh, you know, math interventionists and, and those other support pieces this school year. The other thing, though, most school districts do is they've had just a blanket policy for years and years that everybody gets the same 
no matter what, where you could have higher needs at one building based on test scores and things like that. And so having that flexibility as a school district um, you know, is something that we are going to continue to look at. But we do need to provide um, buildings that may need more assistance because their students may be struggling in an area, more staff or different staff than another building who may not be struggling in that particular area. Yeah, and, and I, I, would, I would simply add to that that it's a, it's a very difficult thing to quantify from year right. to year. And so we've spent a lot of, we've really as an admin team have spent a lot of time over the past 18 months developing systems that will help us to be able to say we, we actually, we are taking all of those things into consideration, both school population and the number of students who are tier two and tier three based on map assessment and other assessments and things like that. So it definitely is something that, that we look at. I figured. And you know, I just want to comment. I think it's a fantastic presentation. I, I think it's very thoughtful. I think every time I kind of look at this, I learn something new from you. So, so I appreciate that. Um, but I guess the, the one question that I still have is, is um, you know, when we have those administration meetings, you know, the, the two that you mentioned, what are the outputs? Like, what are the clear actions that come out of that that we can actually see tangible evidence that that meeting, you know, had these three actions and these are the results that, that we see as a result of that? So I think the, the, the real target of, of that meeting, as an example, is to ensure that, just like we're talking about with teachers, that we as an administrative team have a common understanding and language around what this, what, what this data can tell us, how we can interpret it, and then to start to talk about the ways we want to bring it back to our staff in an individual way. And I think that's where, that's where there's that, we, we, we find that balance between here's what we'll present as a district, and then knowing your teachers, knowing where, where your building is at with looking at data. Some, some buildings are pulling down individual student scores and starting to look at those. Other buildings are taking sort of a, a broader approach and just looking overall at some of the things. And then we come back together and talk about that. So it's, I'm not going to say that there's a, a bulleted list necessarily. I would, I would be, I would, that would be an accurate statement of, of here are the three things that happen from there. But what, what does happen, and I think this is one of the things that that we've, we've really articulated well as a district around professional learning is that we really do learn from each other and from that collaboration. So that's where what Principal A does with their staff and Principal B does with their staff, and we come back together three weeks later and talk about where we're at and, and what the impact was. I think those are, those are, at that level, those are the some of the outcomes we're seeing. When I think about the district meetings we've had with teachers over the past two Mondays where we really made a conscious effort to present the same message by the same people to all of the teachers in grades three through five for example, and really talk through it. Again, we see teachers talking to each other about the ways they approach assessment. We also see people taking away the, 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 the expectation that we will begin to approach our assessment with the lens of keeping all of this, this what IR asks of us in mind. And then it goes to a building level where, they, where those conversations continue. So I, if you're looking for an actual like three-step tangible, I don't, I don't think that's the, I don't think, that's not the structure we're currently in. We can certainly talk about moving more specifically that way, but I think that's where some of that, that principal autonomy is important for us. Well, I'm just you know, thinking yeah. right now in, in terms of spirit of continuous improvement and kind of establishing that culture, how do we kind of get beyond the conversation? I kind of hear you like, we're going to have a conversation, come back in, in three weeks, have another conversation. How do we get well, beyond conversations to... Yeah, no, and, and I, I completely get what you're, what you're asking and what you're saying. I, I think, too... You know, at a higher level, when you look at the administrative meetings that we have, I think some are reviewing data and then planning those early release Mondays based on feedback that we're getting from our staff. Others are looking at the strategic plan as a whole and making sure that we're implementing what is in the strategic plan. So, so some are what I call monitoring meetings and other ones are those big action step meetings. And, and so, you know, I'll use math for example. Um, so, you know, one meeting we can have an outcome is, Justin, are you on target for January to make sure that we're getting our new math curriculum online? If you're not, what do we need to do to, to get there? So I think a lot of what we do in these administrative meetings are, you know, making sure that we hit our deliverables on the strategic plan. Um, others are reviewing data as we get them in and then determining what the next steps are going to be. So for instance, at um, a meeting a few weeks ago, as we started to get the IAR data in, one of the things that we took a look at as an administrative team and, and looked at these early release days coming up was, it's quite clear to us that one of the things that we need to improve on on this assessment is to really help all of us principals and our teachers understand 
exactly the kind of questions that are being asked on this test and how do we replicate those in the curriculum. And so when I was at a meeting today at, at the middle school that, that Justin had set up, we were talking to our teachers about that. And so I think there's two kinds of, there's action step meetings and then there's monitoring meetings to make sure that we get through those. Um, I, I don't want to give the impression, although all cards on the table, this happens sometimes like in any corporation right, right. where you do find yourself saying, okay, this is our third meeting in a row and we haven't moved more than an inch. Um, that's where we have to take a step back and, and really do that. I think, too, one of the biggest pieces that we can do, we can sit and plan as much as we want on the building on 63rd Street. We need to get uh, that robust continuous improvement model fine-tuned at all of our schools because that's where that real action step planning needs to take. We've got to set the, the conditions up for them to be able to do that at the local level because we're the furthest ones away from the classroom. Um, our principals and our teachers, we know if we give them the tools that they need, that's how we're going to do that. So, yes, some of it is spinning wheels from time to time. Other time, though, it is making sure that we put those things in place so they can be more successful. But that, that, that's a very fair question. Yeah, exactly. You know, to kind of use your terminology, like, you know, as in a monitoring meeting, I kind of look at those KPIs, and we didn't meet them on IAR, and we didn't meet a good number of them on, on MAP. So me kind of being, you know, coming from the corporate world, I, I expect an action plan. And, and, and I understand we're kind of implementing the school improvement plans, but I want us to get there quicker, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, think, I think we all do. And, yeah. and the, 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 the struggle is that, while we are focusing on this specific lane of assessment and, and looking at those things, and we spent all we spent targeted time with teachers today from from two fifteen to three forty five. Tomorrow, those teachers are still teaching eight subjects, and so it it, it it takes time to let some of those things sink in and become part of what's happening. I think you know th there's a danger in saying you learned this today. I want to see it in action by Wednesday. I think that's, you know, that, that's the other level of deliverable that I think we, we just, it, it is frustrating to, to, to all of us at some level that a system this big doesn't, doesn't change that quickly. It, 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 it just, and, I, and I know that, that we've had that conversation too. It's not an excuse for we shouldn't be moving forward. I think we have some tangible steps we've taken, but I also think we, we need to remain cognizant of the, the Herculean work that's happening in our classrooms and give our teachers the tools and time to, to bring about some of these, these reflective ideas, but also to make sure that we recognize they're also in the midst of the second year of one new curriculum, the first year of another, and 50 of them are piloting a third. So all of those pieces have to fit together as we, as we think about what those next steps are. I, I think the other key point, though, that I would you know, make and, and commend the boards for looking at this is, is you cannot underestimate the value of a good, solid strategic plan. Um, because even if you're not right at that key performance indicator, it holds everyone accountable to these questions. And so w what I think you're hearing from us tonight is we are closely monitoring that strategic plan on, on macro levels and looking at the curriculum and then you know the, the process. What we now have to do is take that next step at the building level, just like all of us understand the strategic plan in, in the different areas and what we're trying to hit. How do we make sure that our buildings, those individual plans, reflect the strategic plan, but they also have a good understanding of what they need to do for their own key performance indicators to get to the bigger key performance indicators? And so that is the next step that we are um, you know, really focused in on, is how do we bring that home at the building level? Um, not that they're not school improvement planning right now, but how do we take it to the next step to get there quicker, just like you suggested, and, and that's the next piece of the work. So in terms of managing expectations, you know, when can the board kind of accept, expect to kind of see that come to a deliverable that we could, that's tangible that we could see? So I think, you know, by the January meeting, we should have a pretty good process identified in terms of where we want to start going with the school improvement process to share that with you and how it would relate to our current plans. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have thoughts going through my head, and I'd love to get, I want to check an assumption before I make my, my comment. First of all, great presentation, as always, as others have shared. Um, one of the things that's going through my mind is um, out of everybody in this room and the students have, have now left, none of us walk into the room to take these tests, and our students do. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, what is our current approach to how students set goals for themselves for the year. Do you mind just shedding light on that for me and 
what is our school culture or district culture around it before I make my comment? I, I think generally speaking, this is not an assessment that we have used to set student goals. Sorry, it's not uh, specific to any assessment, okay. just their personal goals, possibly inclusive of assessment results, but not exclusive to assessment results. So I, I would not be able to say there is a district consistent approach to something like that. I can tell you that in individual classrooms and buildings, there are, there are teachers who work on fall, winter, spring kind of benchmark type goals, and sometimes that does include assessments. Sometimes it includes the kinds of books we're reading or the numbers of books we're reading and things like that. Um, I think there are places where we, there are individual goal conferences with teachers where a teacher is going to meet with each student and really talk about here's where you are in this, and it may be using a uh, it may be using a map assessment, it may be using a classroom level assessment or a, a writing rubric and say here's where we were with the paper that you've just finished first trimester, let's really talk about which areas do you want to focus in on. So there are, there are certainly at the individual level some of those conversations. I'm not sure that you could walk into every classroom and, and ask every student if they've had that conversation, but that's another piece of that, that process that Kevin's talking about, that we, we do want to start to capture some of those, those consistencies. I think that every classroom talks about growth from point A to point B. I think that some have gotten down to the individual student goal setting level and others keep it a little bit broader at this point. So thanks for sharing that. Um, in my work working with school districts in my day job, uh, we often talk about the term no research about us without us. Uh, and so when you think about students in this case, uh, we're talking about their performance on data. We're not talking about it with them. We're talking about it about them. Uh, and so when we think about how do we ch go from, as a district, from action steps to culture shift, I find, it, I find it hard. I'm not saying that it's impossible. I find it hard to find a way that we get to a culture shift without engaging our students in that culture shift. Um, with some of the districts that I worked closely with when I was uh, in my previous role uh, at an organization working on uh, student improvement in K-8, uh, student academic improvement in K-8, some of the districts where we saw the strongest culture shifts was where the uh, superintendent and the administrative team uh, and then teachers and students were having the same conversation. Uh, and so what I mean by that is uh, at the beginning of the year or somewhere near, you know, around the October time frame after, after a teacher had gotten to know their class, they would set goals for the year for the student, with the student, I shouldn't say for. Uh, and what that looked like was uh, a variety of templates, I'm sure, that could, we, we could source from. Uh, but the idea was that students were able to engage at their level in goals that they set for themselves because at the end of the day, they're the ones walking into taking these assessments or walking out the door to do their homework or walking into club meetings to perform. Uh, and so uh, finding ways when we think about school improvement, uh, that feels like action steps. When we talk about culture shift, I think it has to include our students, it has to include our teachers, it has to include us. But I think what the part that I felt missing from this conversation was our students, and so I wanted to infuse that into the conversation. And I'd love to jump in because I, I couldn't agree with you more. As Greg talked about boardroom to the classroom, I think District 58 in, in most districts often miss sometimes that final step of involving the students. I just looked up at, at Mr. Lynn here, though, our, our principal from El Sierra, and this is one of the things, you know, for the board, just, just as perspective, the board has its goals in the strategic plan. The superintendent, I have my goals in my contract and then in my action steps, and, and the assistant superintendents do, and the principals do, and the teachers do. Oftentimes, we miss the students, and so I want to commend Mr. Lind in, in, in the back. One of the things that we talked about at his goal-setting meeting was how do we get our students to set individual goals. Now, of course, that's going to be tricky in grades K1 and 2, but there are ways to do that. Um, and there are tools out there to do that. So we are just starting to scratch the surface, but I, I think it's not only a good point, but a good suggestion is how do we roll that out system-wide? Because that quote that you shared, um, no research about us without us, I, I think makes a lot of sense. If we're just talking about students and not involving them in the process, you're not going to get the same returns as if they are more involved in the process. And so I know some of our principals, like Mr. Lind, are really working on that. And um, I think that is, is the way to go in a school setting. And so we can certainly have further conversations about what that looks like across our entire system. Thanks. Just a couple comments. Um, as I looked through the presentation beforehand, and now after kind of listening to everybody talk a little bit more, um, things that kind of jumped out at me, first of all, I think, the growth that we've shown over the past couple of years is is something to be really proud of. I know obviously, of course, there's always more areas for improvement and you do want to be continuously looking to always be moving forward. 
Um, I think that there's a couple important things that we need to make sure, and a couple of people have kind of touched on them a little bit, but just to, to really kind of always be remembering that um, it wasn't very long ago, it wasn't that many years ago, where I was sitting out there and listening to people talk about how it's been 10 years since we've updated this curriculum and 12 years since we did that curriculum and, and so on and so forth. And I think um, there was a, a period of time where some of those things that were maybe not given the focus they would do at the time. And I think that now that we are in a process of curriculum updating across the board, and like you talked about, we're really only on year two of, of ELA and more on year one of science and so on and so forth and I think as we see those changes come to fruition and we see those um, curriculum updates and the continuity across the board from school to school as we see those things um, really kind of set in in each of the schools you're going to s like see the fruits of that of that labor I think that that um, I'm not articulating well I think um, some of that, it, it just takes a long time, I think, to Steve's point that we want these things to happen faster. And I, I, obviously, we all understand that perspective. But at the same time, it's very hard for a school or a teacher or a district to undo. Not the damage is not the right word. But um, I wrote down a note, and I want to find it really quick. Um, Teachers and administration, it's hard for them to undo years of, of potential lack of focus on something like curriculum update. Um, in a, a year or two, it's going to take longer than that for those types of improvements to, to come around. And I think we just have to, not to say we're not constantly looking for improvement, but to expect instant, complete turnaround is, is not necessarily possible. Um, I also think something like the professional development is, again, something that we've implemented now that is going to help to see the kinds of increases we want to see and we need to give those things time to work um, and time to to kind of come to fruition um, none of those things also are, are necessarily new concepts to education I think a lot of other when we talk about comparing ourselves to other districts, whether it's other feeder districts in the 99 or other more comparable districts maybe 258 if you look around DuPage County especially, a lot of those districts have been doing something like early professional release for years already and we're in year one. You know, So I think those types of things, when you look at our comparisons to other districts, you have to keep those things in mind as well that I think in some ways we're kind of catching up with the curve and we need to make sure that those things are allowed time to, to work. You know, I think sometimes in education, we give up on something just when people feel like they're finally catching up with them. We're like, oh, now we're done with that. And teachers are like, oh, I just felt like I just finally got a handle on it. And now we're giving it up. So I think that's something you have to keep in mind. I definitely felt that way with my teaching experience. That there was a lot of times when all of a sudden I was like, oh, we're done with that. I just was starting to feel like I liked it. So I think just something to keep in the back of the mind. I mean, I agree with everyone's thoughts on we need to be continuously moving forward. But I also think we need to be recognizing that we're coming from a place where maybe we're, we're kind of playing a little bit of catch up in some areas and I think that that's important to remember as well. I appreciate too, Emily, you talking about comparables because I, I definitely think when we're looking at our assessments, um, unlike NWA MAP, uh, which gives you built in, you can look at your, so if you're an individual school, you can compare yourself to schools that started with that exact same RIT score mm -hmm. um, through the conditional growth index. You don't necessarily have that with IAR. Mm -hmm. And so one of the software tools that we have is actually on the business side of things. It's Forecast 5 Analytics. And that allows us to drill down and look at districts that would have similar EAVs to our school district, similar low income percentages, similar um, students with IEPs, similar, you know, it, it going down the road. And um, we may find that some of our neighboring districts aren't the best comparables, but you know, there could be one on the North Shore, there could be one out West that that's a better fit for us based on the same set of circumstances that we have. And so one of the things that we are going to, you know, take a look at is a, I think it's very important to always look at the feeder districts in 99 and, and how we're comparing 
comparing to um, you know the high school where we're sending uh, people in and we're doing a, a data sharing consortium that you're all aware of uh, that should be rolling out um, soon when the high school uh, is able to put that together but also to take a look beyond those borders to see how are we doing with comparable districts? I think that's a very fair thing. I also think you make a really good point, and, and as a former teacher, I struggle with this as well, is, is that um, you know, we're better off doing one or two things very well than 15 things very poorly and in, in, in moving to the next. And in, in, you know, so, so point well taken on all those. Thank you. A lot of good discussion points up here tonight, and uh, thank you guys for for all of that. Uh, I'm going to be brief because I'd like to let you sit down. You've been standing up here. <laughs> um, we only have two more minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just, just real quick. There, first of all, um, there's been a tectonic shift in this in the last two years, and that's under yes. your leadership. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, the rigor change that we've seen in the district um, and, the law, and this very thoughtful approach to curriculum is not going unrecognized. Mm -hmm. We're in the infancy of it. I know we can even, when you're implementing some of this new stuff, we may even see a couple little tips here and there and to kind of go along with your thing. That doesn't mean we're doing the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It means we're just in the middle of the process and mm -hmm. we need to be patient. As a person who works with a lot of small companies, some of them very agile, where I can go in and we can make a massive shift in the matter of maybe a couple of months, I realize that's like driving a speedboat compared to an ocean liner and I know that I have to be patient and that's been the hardest thing for me since I took this seat uh, on the board. A couple of really good pieces of information that you put up there, and in fact it's on the screen right now, is that summative total and then telling us where it relates to between the difference between tier one and tier two. Um, as we all know from your last conversation, tier one and tier two are really this, the, through the exact same achievement, but one puts you into the top 10%. Um, so that number is actually more valuable to me sort of where we are in the spectrum. How close are you to that top 10%? Where are you? That's really meaningful for me. Uh, what's not meaningful me in, for me in the IAR assessment is when you have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and a 4 and 5 is good and a 1, 2, and 3 is bad, I think where I find a challenge is how close, you know, like we missed the mark, but how close are we to, which if we had percentages, like, if we, oh, we need to hit 80% and we hit 76, we know we've got to, so are we able to use tools like MAP and stuff like that to sort of help guess, you know, maybe where, how close we are, and you don't have to have numbers on that, I'm just, I'm wondering if we're trying to figure out where some of those gaps may be. We are, and the state doesn't make it super easy to do that, yeah, but we, we've pulled down all the data and, and James has actually put together, mm -hmm. we're, we're building it out so we can not only look at some of those things, but actually start to look more specifically at, you know, the, the, the the, the ranges we see between different programs and, and all different kinds of things. So it's, again, not, and the one thing I didn't say that I, I, I feel like I should every time we talk about data is we're spending a lot of time talking about one individual data set. And we only have two years worth of data with the IAR where we can say we've had this a consistent approach. So we don't have a lot of trend to look at, you know, like yeah. that. But that, that it's another piece that we're starting to look at is, is, you know, is this, are some of these numbers anomalies? There are a couple of numbers that are drastically different from last year for individual schools. What will that look like in three years? You know, I mean, it doesn't mean we ignore it for the time being, but it's also just some, a, a good piece of the conversation is that we want to keep that in mind. The short answer is yes, we are able to do that through some pretty intensive internal calculation, and, and we're working to look at the data in just that way. And, and then, Darren, also just to, to piggyback, one of the numbers that we do have available on the state report card is just the percentage of kids that were in that three range that just need that little extra more to get pushed up in the four or two to three or, or one to two. And so I think that's a really nice number for schools to look at because that comes with names of individual students at the school level where they can set growth goals for each one of those kids to, to get to that next level. And thanks again. And just as a kind of a closing remark, I've had an opportunity just recently to, to just chat with a, with a couple of teachers and the buy-in that's happening on all of our our curriculum is, is really incredible. Um, I, I, is, is a person that, that's been sitting on the board for the last couple of years, as we started some of this process, the aggressiveness by which we're taking on new curriculum has always made me a little bit nervous, with the exception of the, I really want to make sure we start hitting these metrics and really start helping all the kiddos out there. And um, uh, I, I think it says a lot about the way that we're rolling this stuff out, because it, there's, there's still a lot of excitement in the trenches for it, so uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that as well. Thank you. Very quick follow-up. Can we talk about this? 
briefly, but we can the board have a um, report of the weighted index scores for the all groups and all the subgroups for each building? Yes, and so I've been taking notes, and, and Justin and I will, you know, get together in every follow-up or, or additional report that the board has asked for tonight. One of the things that we will do is get it out in the updates um, for the Board of Education, and then we can bring back, bring those back at a subsequent meeting for the public as well. But uh, we will certainly follow up on those. What I intend to do is to try and get as much of that information out to the board in our weekly update this Friday. If we miss something, though, please let me know, and then I would follow up with that in a subsequent one. Justin and I were actually just having that conversation earlier today when you give presentations like this, there's always good questions that come out and how can we, you know, help provide more of that information. But the subgroups, the breakdown, what I just want to be careful of is depending on how big these reports are, what we may have to do. Um, it may be this update or it may be the next one, but we'll continue to get that out there so all of your questions are answered. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Justin. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are six communications received by the board. Are there any uh, additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right, then uh, with that, we'll move on to some reports to the board. We'll start with uh, Dr. Russell with the superintendent report. So again, I'd like to thank Mr. Sissel for the Illinois School Report Card meetings. He's done a great job, and um, he's already had several visits to schools, but more to come. And so for the members of the public, please contact your building principal if you have any questions about those. If you missed the meeting, we could even get you that presentation as well. I um, want to highlight a few events that took place uh, in the district the last week. One was at uh, Herrick Middle School last Tuesday. The Herrick PTA, um, Tracy, I want to thank you for your leadership on that. That was not for Tracy, the board member. That was Tracy, the, the PTA yeah. member. And uh, the, the Herrick PTA invited all the other PTAs across Downers Grove 58 to view screen agers the next chapter. And um, it was an eye-opening documentary. I, I think it really did a nice job of talking about technology um, from adults on down and the impact that that has. One of the things that was evident to me as the school superintendent and that we're going to continue to discuss in our district as well as at the high school district was just the increased rates of student anxiety and student depression that we're seeing in 2019, which devices are not the only cause of that, but they certainly play a role into that. And so to be very cognizant of technology and its impact on students, I think is something that all districts are starting to really re-examine. And that was a very good reminder for all of us. Um, I think technology can be a wonderful thing, but I do think the pendulum and education has swung very far. And now to start reviewing that, how much of a good thing is too much, is something that we're definitely looking at. And so I want to commend the Herrick PTA for putting that together. And uh, we also had a panel. Uh, Drew Barzak of the Downers Grove Police Department was there. I'd like to thank the village for allowing him to come and to present with us. In the finance section of my update, I want to highlight the work of the Health and Wellness Committee. Uh, over the last several weeks, the Health and Wellness Committee, along with group alternatives, have provided many educational opportunities regarding insurance benefits and open enrollment. The open enrollment deadline is this Friday, November 15th or 15th, excuse me. These sessions included larger groups, small group, and individual meetings. The focus has been to fully educate all of our employees on their health benefits so everyone can become better consumers. We know when we're better health consumers, we make better decisions, and the premiums for everyone go down, which then frees up money for other things in the school district. I see one of our association presidents, Craig, in the audience. I just want to thank him, Mark White, Andy Schmidt, uh, for really helping go out. We, we've been tag teaming these presentations. Um, been very well attended teachers and, and support staff are asking great questions but it would not have happened without the help of our uh, employees who are also in the plan and so I certainly want to thank them for all of their hard work it, it's been very well received and uh, we've got some very very smart people on our health and wellness committee and then of course Todd um, thank you for all of your work in, in Jane as well for facilities one of the most um, frequently asked questions that I get when I visit schools are playgrounds what is going on with, with, with the playgrounds um, you know in, we have put a memo out to the board. We've shared that with building principals. And we're still in a holding pattern for when this money is going to be released by the state. Um, if that money does not come through in our district's draft master facility plan, though, there is money in there for playground upgrades. And so if for some reason the state continues to drag their feet and we don't get that money, that would be our next course of action then to take that through the citizen task force and to speak of that. We still have that money budgeted for the, for the schools and, and according to the, the law, how that would be spread out because our individual schools are listed in the bill, but we're still waiting to see when that money would come through um, and we're 
talking to Representative Stava Murray to see, and, and she's working on that as well. Um, the public relations section of my report for the Citizens Task Force, that is um, going to start getting moving. Um, I've just identified a potential date for the first meeting with Paul Hanley, and that date would be December 18th. So uh, one month away, we would really start that. That was always the goal, to have a meeting uh, by mid-December. So by this Friday, um, I've received several recommendations from administrators, from staff, from key stakeholders, from business leaders in the community about people who they think might be interested. So it, it's kind of a filtering process, just like we would have done for our committee. So this Friday, I will be sending out invites asking people, you know, you've been recommended, are you interested in this? And then kind of filtering that down in a very similar way that 99 uh, did there. So within the next several weeks, I hope to have that group of about 30 to 35 people who are very interested. We may even shoot a little higher for that number because we know that all those people are going to be able to attend every single meeting. But that's the goal, to have about 30 people each meeting. And the first meeting would be December 18th, which is a Wednesday night. I may be getting that. It's either the 18th or the 19th. I have to look at my calendar. But it's that Wednesday right before winter break where we would really start to take a look at um, that 6-8 middle school question and then how this process is going to work as we go through. On this Wednesday evening for public relations, our PTA presidents, our PTA council will be meeting with the administrators, so all of the district office and then half of our principal group. There's two meetings each year. The other one will be in March, and that's a time for us to get together, not only to thank our PTAs, but to really talk to them about questions they may have, and then to share with them a lot of the information that we share at board meetings. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Under the personnel section, I want to congratulate Kevin Bardo, our Director of Buildings and Grounds. Kevin recently uh, completed a training program and comprehensive exam to become a certified professional supervisor uh, from the Illinois Association of School Business Officials. So that is a very high level that Kevin has gone to in facility management. So we want to uh, commend Kevin. Uh, that's something that he did uh, on his own, and um, it's only going to help improve how our facilities are run. So thank you, Kevin, and congratulations on your hard work. Kudos. In the area of technology, um, over the last uh, month or so, I've received many concerns from our parents regarding when students are bringing their devices home. I think many of our parents feel, or, or we're under the assumption, I should say, that the devices that they bring home are still on our network and are still filtered in the same manner that when they're here at school. Um, that is not the case. So when, when people bring their device home, you're under the protections of your home network, and many of us may have different protections. Um, ironically, we've been talking about this all fall as a school district. Um, several districts have the same filtering. Other districts do not. Um, district 58 has not had that same filtering um, when our devices are brought at home. Um, given the fact that it's 2019 and one of our goals is to keep students as safe as possible, we have been talking about that, and um, James Eichmeller is in the process of piloting um, several different grade levels. In fact, we're, we're going to roll it all the way out to all of our grade levels where we can replicate the filter that we have here at school at home. So um, we're just starting to roll this process out. So I want to thank our parents for sharing that concern. That's how we work very well together when parents bring that up to us, and then we can talk about it. So we're going to be piloting um, potential solutions to this, and, and James is going to be sending out more information to our families before this goes, uh, you know, full out, um, and then we'll reassess at the end of the school year whether or not it was successful, whether or not this is something we want to invest in, but we will also be, you know, re-communicating out to our parents because I think we all recognize that we, we hit that very hard when this first started, but it, it's gotten a little lax, and so I don't think all of our parents fully understood when these devices were coming home that they weren't on the same level of protection as when they were at school. So again, I can't thank our parents enough for sharing their concerns with us and working together to try and improve this situation. And so that's where we're at with our devices. And James, thank you for your hard work on that, and um, we look forward to seeing the uh, results. Just some quick others. Obviously, today was Veterans Day, so uh, again, I want to reiterate our, our big thanks to our veterans, not only in the community of Downers Grove, but throughout our entire country. Every single one of our schools did something unique for Veterans Day. Um, many children um, are off on Veterans Day. It's a day of non-attendance in the state of Illinois. District 58 has chosen to attend school on Veterans Day, and I think that is a fantastic move by the school board and our community. 
I really welcome the chance to work with our buildings to teach during Veterans Day about the importance of this day and the sacrifices that the men and women of our military have made. Um, I had the honor of uh, attending Bel Air's uh, ceremony today. They did a fantastic job and um, I also want to um, just recognize the Gilbert family, which is a Gold Star family in Downers Grove. Uh, they had family members there today, and that was something very special where all of our students got to recognize uh, the Gilbert family. So again, um, on behalf of the Board of Education for families like the Gilbert family and all of our veterans, we just want to say thank you, and our schools did a wonderful job of recognizing everyone today. Coming up, I still can't believe, it, it feels like we went right by Thanksgiving, but um, the uh, middle to end of November every year, there is what's called the annual Triple I Conference uh, downtown. And the annual Triple I Conference is the Illinois Association of School Boards, the Illinois Association of School Administrators, and the Illinois Association of Business Officials get together in Chicago to offer professional development to um, school boards. Uh, school board secretaries and school administrators in various areas. They have a number of strands. Uh, several of the board members and administrators and, and Melissa will be attending that conference again. Um, we have new board members who have never been to that conference, so I wanted to take a little bit of time today and just talk about what that is. In general, it, it is a wide open conference with hundreds and hundreds of different sessions. Um, Administrators present. I'll be presenting on Saturday afternoon um, on the power of social media and the superintendency. There's several other presentations that you can attend. So one of the things that I encourage all board members to do is to go to ISB.com and look at the different strands. So some of the strands include best practices, community engagement, critical issues, finance and funding, government relations, um, school law, school safety and security, and student learning. Two big ones that I'll be focusing in on this year are community relations and, and finance. I, I wonder why, right? All the things that we're, we're doing with our facility planning. But I did want to pause here and ask uh, board members if you've identified any strands that you'd like to go to or if you have any questions about the Triple I conference. Uh, I, I found a couple. There's hundreds, literally. Hundreds, yes. <laughs> um, so am I, like we, we can, we don't have to sign up, we can just go and, and walk out if it doesn't suit us? That's correct, and that's not an uncommon thing. Um, the one thing I would tell you though is to make sure that you get there early for your sessions because some are much more popular than others, especially if it happens to be located in the Hyatt because that's kind of the center point. And the further out you get, the less and less people you get who walk out in the cold weather. So for instance, the, the school business officials do a lot of their work at the Sheridan and those tend to, no offense Todd, not <laughs> as, as well attended as some of the ones that are right in the, um, the Hyatt there. But I've been to sessions where I walked in and, and thought, this is not what I signed up for. And then you can quickly go to another one, but I would always encourage the board board members to do is to have maybe a first and second choice for each session because sometimes they do get so crowded you may not be able to get in but many of the presenters will put their stuff online where you can then look at it at a later time. You may not walk out of Kevin's presentation though. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Never. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there was several I, I had written down or marked that I wanted to try to go to. The um, family engagement, fostering meaningful connections was one that I saw there was some school safety ones that I was interested in personally, so um, I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited about it. And I know our wellness uh, push is going very well because I had a member of our wellness committee stop me today and said, did you see the session on health and wellness at two o'clock at Triple I on Saturday? <laughs> this is something you might want to go to. And I thought, wow, we are really doing a good job with health and wellness <laughs> if I've got members looking up what, what presentations we have at the Triple I committee. So, um, but, but again, if you've got any questions, especially if you're new, this conference is overwhelming. There's something like 800 school districts in Illinois almost all of which send members to this particular conference and then when you multiply that by the administrators and all of that down there, it's really the only chance for board members to get really good professional development on a large scale like that. And so it is very crowded. There's lots of people there. It's a great opportunity to learn and grow. But please contact me if you have any questions as we go through that. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, just a couple of other quick things. Um, on behalf of School District 58, we want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I know, still can't believe we're saying that, um, but you know, we've got a lot to be thankful for in Down Earth Grove and especially in District 58. I want to thank all of our students, teachers, and support staff for all the work they do on a daily basis um, because it makes a difference. So we're very thankful for all of the work that everyone does. Um, we have some upcoming events. The most important one coming up here quickly is November 15th is Board Member Appreciation Day. So thank you, school board members, for everything that you do. Uh, November 18th, which is next Monday, we have a Board of Education Financial Workshop at El Sierra School. Uh, the week of November 25th, which is Thanksgiving week, there's no student attendance during that week. It just so happened that the calendar for the last two years does not have student attendance during that week. The central office will be open, though, on Monday and Tuesday of that week. And then uh, December 9th is the next time we'll be here for a Village Hall meeting. That's all that I have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other yeah. questions? Fantastic. And with that, we'll move on to our monthly business report with Todd Rayfall. In the interest of time, I'd like to say that my report is as written. <laughs> um, I, will, uh, I will echo uh, Dr. Russell's comments about um, the open enrollment process in the meetings. Last year, we had one of our most successful open enrollment meetings where we had 30 or 40 people, and uh, the DGEA had moved their meeting, and we scheduled it so that people could be at that meeting before theirs. Um, this has done, you know, we've been able to make adjustments, and I think we've probably seen or touched about 85% of uh, the staff. So that, um, by any measure of open enrollment, uh, is a huge success piece. So, and we know people are going in and looking through and, and, and pushing through on their portal, so we appreciate that part. Uh, year to day report is, you know, is a, it, it, we went through, well, we had a FAC meeting, a, a financial advisory committee meeting uh, on Friday. Uh, we went through um, that uh, in, in some detail. It is um, trailing along with, you know, as expected, along with um, prior years. So we're in good shape there. Um, you have on an action item this evening uh, the tax levy. Uh, this is 80 some odd percent of the revenue for the you know for the year, and uh, that was it's as presented or discussed and reviewed. Uh, at the October meeting uh, that the board saw in presentation. It was also attached to the report a lengthy vocabulary uh, memo just as an informational item uh, to kind of help give probably a little more detail than most anybody would want to want <laughs> about uh, property taxes, but uh, just to kind of something to read when you can't sleep. So other than that, unless there are questions, um, I will be done with my report. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. All right, on to our committees. Uh, the policy committee did not meet uh, since our last meeting. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Right? No, that's, it's correct. <laughs> I had a moment where I thought I'd moved something, but it's in the right place. All right, perfect. <laughs> um, the legislative committee has not met since the last board meeting. Um, but the Financial Advisory Committee did. We met on November 8th. Um, I'll try to be brief here. We did. We, uh, we had a nice meeting. It was a little bit different because we had some new members this week. So we spent a little bit more time um, on the year-to-date report than uh, we're kind of accustomed to. Now that we've had that kind of standard report, our goal is to move through that in sort of the first few minutes of, of the meeting just to kind of look at the health. But we did take an opportunity, one, to go around the table and get to know um, all of our new members as well as sort of walk through those reports and, and what they mean. Um, we, we took a brief look at the, the MRF, the Medical Reserve Fund, um, which is in a much stronger state than it's been the last uh, two years. So we'll just continue to keep a close eye on that and other expenses as we'll continue to see in the future from the, the Health and Wellness Committee uh, reporting uh, to us here. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about our cash flow uh, and just in general what our working cash fund needs to look like and, um, and what a status of a good fund balance should be. And 
kind of noting that our low point is in May. And as we've talked about before, we get two really big chunks of money. And so when we get to that point where we're waiting for that next big uh, check to come in from, from property tax, uh, it can get quite low. So one of the things that we really discussed was the idea of uh, implementing a policy around fund balance. As you remember, when we had our financial workshop, we were really talking about the fact it's great that we finally gotten to the point where we're at a balanced budget, but balance isn't really balanced anymore if our fund balance is going to get too low. So um, obviously we're going to be voting later on today on the implementation of getting uh, Press Plus from the ISB uh, for policy creation. And as part of that, um, taking one of their baseline policies for um, fund balance management and making sure we implement that and having that brought in, having that language brought into the Financial Advisory Committee to, to review and make sure that that makes sense uh, moving forward. The last part was the, the tax levy, which we're going to be voting on. Uh, CPI was still hovering at about 1.9%. Obviously, that can still shift a little bit, hopefully, but we're, we're, we're thinking that's where it's going to be at. And so uh, we're looking at what, is it 2.64% over last year? 2.6? Right. That's yeah. the, the levy. The levy. The levy is about two point six four. Um, as far as from what and that's CPI and collected. construction. Correct. Yep. Correct. And, and we don't know yet what the total will be, and we'll know that in the spring. Right. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Otherwise, that concludes my report. Unless Steve has anything oh. uh, to add. Well, once again, an excellent summary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then with that, uh, the district leadership team did not meet, neither did the Health and Wellness Committee. All right. And with that, um, we have no regular discussion items on tonight's agenda. So that moves us on to the reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative <coughs> staff as appropriate. Uh, criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. Uh, we encourage you to keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, uh, have we received any cards? Nothing. All right, then if we haven't, um, we ask that anyone who's interested in speaking to please uh, step up to the podium and um, uh, just state your name and your attendance area. There should also be cards up there as well, so uh, we do like to follow up with you after. So if you would mind putting your name and email address on there, that would be great. Um, so we will go ahead and open the floor. The stampede is always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we comfortable going through recess and keep going? Keep, keep going. Yes. All, right. All right. Well, then. With that, let's move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? No. All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes for October 7th, 2019 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 7th, 2019 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 16th, 2019 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Yeah, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from October 16th regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 28th, 2019 curriculum workshop as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 28th, 2019 curriculum workshop as presented. Now on to the uh, approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items that board members would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and the financial statements consisting of a list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. 
We have a few items up for uh, recommended for action tonight. The first one is the American Education Week, Resol Week resolution. Is there a motion to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented? Do I have a copy? Yeah. Whereas the public schools are an important and integral part of our society, and whereas the concept of a free and equal education is an American tradition and is the country's strength, and whereas the students of today are leaders of tomorrow, and whereas all citizens have a responsibility to support the public schools, now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District 58, DuPage County, Illinois, hereby proclaim November 18th through 22nd, 2019, American Education Week, and urge all citizens to make a commitment to public education and to the future of our community, state, and nation by visiting their local public schools and by no donating their time and talents to help make the public schools even better. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented. Next up is our 2019 Certificate of Levy. Is there a motion to adopt the 2019 Certificate of Levy in the amount of 58735000 So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? I know we've talked about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried to adopt the 2019 certificate of levy in the amount of $58,735,000. Uh, now we have the 2019 ISB resolutions as recommended by the Legislative Committee and the Administration. Are there any resolutions a board member would like to have considered separately? I'll, uh, I'll suggest for the group uh, that we consider items, resolutions 1, 3, 10, and an amended position 13 separately from the rest of the agenda. I just want to remind you this is not the consent agenda, so we can't discuss without, so you want to separate those votes up? Mm -hmm. Oh, we votes can, up. as long as we can discuss we can those discuss in them. We can discuss all of them because it's not a consent agenda. Okay. So are you pulling these out because you want a separate vote on them or are you pulling them out to discuss? I am pulling them out to discuss. When we do vote though, will we have to vote all in favor of the administration slash committee's proposal or all against? If we pull them out, that would be a separate, so if we, pull, we can we vote can separately. Pull, right, we can vote separately. Would you like so to vote on those separately? I'll suggest that we vote separately on item 13, the amended position for the prevailing wage. Okay. Um, but, but 1, 3, and 10, you're just 1, 3, and 10, it. I just want to discuss it. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. Is there a motion to approve the positions on each of the resolutions in the 2019 Resolutions Committee Report as presented in the attached spreadsheet with the exception of Resolution 13 and direct the IASB Delegate Kirat Doshi to cast his vote accordingly on behalf of District 58? Just a reminder, once we have the motion, then we can discuss. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? I'll let you yep. kick it up. So just to recap for everybody about the process that we go through here annually. Um, at the Triple I conference on Saturday, uh, there is a session called the IASB Delegate Assembly. That's the Illinois Association of School Board Delegate Assembly. Every school board in the state, all 800 uh, or so, would choose to send a, um, uh, a delegate to the Delegate Assembly to vote on a a predetermined set of resolutions or position statements. The IESB is our seven lobbying organization in Springfield. And so when we ask them to go campaign on our behalf on a particular position to take with, in Springfield with the legislator, we're at the uh, I conference when we're giving them direction on how to vote or how to campaign on our behalf. Um, every year, uh, the, triple, uh, the IESB puts out the um, 
process by which sponsoring districts can suggest positions that they want the IESB to campaign on our behalf about. Uh, and ultimately, they put those back to vote uh, to all of the school districts in the state. Um, and so with this process, we are currently at the stage where all 18 of these resolutions or position statements have been put out. And we now have a chance to discuss and debate where is it that the one vote that District 58 gets at the Delegate Assembly, how should we vote? And on our behalf, I would go vote um, as the Delegate Representative. Um, and so this is our opportunity to review the positions that the committee or the administration have suggested that we take as a district um, and discuss either our affirmation or our disagreement with those positions. Uh, and we will ultimately vote on um, uh, will ultimately vote as a uh, as a board on uh, whether we uh, whether those positions are the ones we want to make as our vote uh, at the Triple I conference. Um, so, with that, uh, any questions about the process before we go into specific positions? Okay. Anything to add, Emily? No. Perfect. All right. Um, so, I uh, think that we should discuss in open session uh, specifically uh, resolutions one, three. 10 and 13 and the reason that I called out 13 specifically is because there was at the legislative committee uh, this concept of the prevailing wage the wage that districts and all government bodies in the state are required to pay for uh, labor and other services uh, for uh, you know to support for facilities and so on the prevailing wage is something that we are we are asked to pay up typically above market value uh, for those services um, and the committee ultimately had, in essence, a split decision on what the district should, district's position should be. And so we didn't feel comfortable saying that the committee's voice is X. We asked the administration to give us their suggestion. Uh, even with that, I do want to have a conversation in open session about the prevailing wage uh, and our position as a district on that. Uh, and so we can start our conversation there, because that'll be one specific one that we would have to vote on separately. Um, but we can start a conversation there on item 13. And just to clarify, thank you for, for that, Karat. The prevailing wage in, in the past, school districts um, had to vote on whether or not they would accept the prevailing wage, um, which was kind of a, an exercise in futility because by law, school districts have to pay the prevailing wage. So you could have set yourself up for a situation where a board would vote no, but then if you didn't pay that, you would be violating the law. So they've taken that provision out. The school district is still bound by every measure to pay prevailing wage. And um, our chief school business official would get that from the county and then they would tell us what the prevailing wage is. So when we do any kind of work in our school district, we have to pay prevailing wage. The one point that I want to make is um, we pay prevailing wage. Um, sometimes, though, you can get non-union members who are the only people who apply to bid for a job. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to hire union workers. What it means is you have to pay anyone that you hire the prevailing wage, so whoever that low bidder is. Oftentimes, that is a union um, shop that is going to bid for that. But I have been in positions in school districts where no union bids on that, but you're still paying the prevailing uh, wage. School districts were then forced to keep records of certified payrolls that we no longer have to do under the new legislation that the county takes care of all of that. What this is asking is the IASB has a resolution that they're recommending that local government bodies no longer be tied to the prevailing wage. So they're trying to lobby Springfield to change the law, so to speak. That's what this is voting on. So I didn't want to confuse the two there. Um, in my humble opinion as the superintendent, I don't think that there is a chance that that law would ever change in the state of Illinois in the current political environment, but that's, that's just my opinion. So then by the rigmarole, which is just some kind of statement from West Prairie Community Unit District, School District 103. So one of the things that I think school districts are often forced to, so what happens with these resolutions is that in, the, in this convention, the Illinois Association of School Boards is bound to put these things up if a member district goes through the steps of asking for consideration. And I think that's a very healthy part of the, the process. There are several school districts that are so financially strapped that they're looking at certain projects and if they 
would pay a fair value in, in their eyes, and, they, and again, fair is a, is, a, is a subjective word, so I want to be careful there, um, they could significantly save costs and still do these. So they're trying to put pressure on their group, which is the school board association, to put pressure on legislators. So, so that's why they're doing that, regardless of how long of a shot it is. And then you also have others that would bring up our school district may be fine paying prevailing wage, but we don't want to be forced into anything. We want it to be our own choice in, in what we decide to do. And ultimately, that's where the administration's recommendation came down from, is we're all for local control and giving that power to you. We're not suggesting that you don't pay fair wages or anything like that. And I think that's an important thing to remember. I mean, as opposed to, I mean, think about the varying difference in um, cost of living throughout the state and so to have a sort of an arbitrary number set by the state does take a lot of power away from us and the ability to spend the money uh, of, of our constituency so um, I in general I, I generally have always kind of found the prevailing wage kind of a silly thing when we had to vote on it because by law it was like every week every year we were sitting here yes. voting on it and we were going but this doesn't make any sense can we vote it down we, we would be breaking the law if we didn't pay it um, and it can be frustrating, you know, when, when, we, when we sat and we were bidding out some contracts, you know, as, as, as we were looking and we were trying to penny pinch and, and cutting things out of our project, as we had uh, a member on our board who was going through a, a building project of his own and building similar things cost significantly less for him. I, I, think, I think it can be frustrating for, for our community at large and stuff as well. So I, I think having that ability to, I, and like you said, I, I doubt that this would ever, um, happen anyway, but, but it, in general, as much control as we can have in our district, I think, is, is a good thing. So. Um, I feel like um, as a government institution of sorts, we are spending taxpayers' dollars, um, and in that sense, we want to make sure that we are um, taking into consideration not just our own personal, personal meaning, personal as a district, not personal as ourselves, but um, our own personal stake or goals, but the goals of the community at large, society at large, when we're spending our taxpayer dollars. And I think that um, the prevailing wage is intended to, in my understanding and in my interpretation, the prevailing wage is intended to um, ensure that labor and services rendered to a government body are um, paid fairly and at a living wage. And I think that in terms of the betterment of society as a whole, um, that's an important point, and I think that um, we should be supporting that. I, I, I personally feel that supporting the prevailing wage is something that will help to not only advance our community, we don't know, you know, members, people in our community could be the ones doing this work that we're talking about paying out. And so do we want those people paid a fair and living wage based on what is determined to be the prevailing wage, the prevailing wage from what I understand is determined based on the average um, amount paid for similar services in the same area. So they look at the county, they say what are, what are plumbers paid around DuPage County and what's the average plumbers are paid and that is how they determine the prevailing wage. So from my perspective, if we want to continue to advance the, the general well-being of our community, paying the prevailing wage is, is a small factor. And even if that means that potentially we're having to pay more for services, I guess you have to weigh out, you know, what's more important is saving money by paying people less than the average rate, more important than paying people the average rate. I tend to think it's more important to pay people a fair and living wage for their services rendered based on what the prevailing wage is set at. So that's just my personal. Stance. Your point is well taken. Um, I personally, I'll be frank, I didn't give this a lot of thought um, of all the positions um, to that we had that we we're in this packet. This isn't one I, I, I um, spent too much time focusing on. 
Um, but given the comments, um, I guess if I had to come down the side, I'm going to come down on the side of local control, um, to Kevin's point. Um, and then that gives us the power as a school district to pay, pay with the wage that we see fit, um, to support our community, like you're saying, um, to support um, the, the contractors and the laborers who are working in our community, working outside of our community. Um, I don't, th I, you know, again, the idea that, that, that Springfield's going to change this, I don't, I don't agree with, but just the idea that um, we get to make that decision rather than having a decision hoisted upon us, um, I would just, I would, I would favor local control. Any other comments on that? Okay. Uh, you also had one, three, and ten. Yep. So there's a few other items on the uh, resolutions that I think are worth discussing in open meeting. As those that recall last year, there was a proposal by a uh, district in the state on uh, allowing handguns in schools. Uh, there are, this year, there are two proposals that discuss this, a similar topic, uh, both of them with different approaches to it and different amendments to what was proposed last year. Um, the uh, quick background on um, this proposal by the recommending school district and then another one by another recommending school district, the background on it is uh, for districts that are in rural areas, they find it more difficult to have quick response times from local law enforcement officials just because of the space between school buildings and their local law enforcement offices. Uh, or uh, law, law enforcement uh, places. And so uh, it, it can take upward of 15 to 20 minutes for a local sheriff or a local police department to make it to an emergency call at a school building. Uh, that's less true for us here in Downers Grove. The response time typically here is probably in the range of one to four minutes. Um, and so we don't face that same hurdle that rural school districts make. With that context, uh, districts have recommended two different approaches. Uh, resolution number one, which is uh, around the uh, ideas of student safety, is to <coughs> offer local school district officials, and that's school boards, to uh, have the power to decide. Currently, this is not the state case, so let me state the law as it stands today. As it stands today, all school buildings in the state of Illinois are gun-free zones, uh, unless you are a law enforcement official. So if you are a police officer, on duty or off duty, you are allowed to carry a firearm into our buildings. That's true ac across the state of Illinois. Uh, what Resolution 1 suggests is that uh, school boards could vote to allow volunteers, in, uh, volunteer employees who volunteer in the school district to carry firearms, uh, as long as they are FOID card, holder, FOID card holders. Um, and also, in addition to being FOID card, or card holders, go through subsequent uh, require training to be a armed uh, official in the building, even if they are not law enforcement officials. That's one take on it. That's resolution one. Resolution three takes a different approach. It suggests that uh, instead of arming uh, adults in the building that might be FOID card holders, uh, let's uh, require the state government to provide funding so that school resource officials, SROs, typically those SROs are typically uh, retired police officers uh, in, in most cases, in many cases, I should say. Um, provide them the funding to pay for a school resource official. That often ends up becoming the hurdle for uh, school buildings is they don't have a first response person on site and available uh, when an incident, potentially like an active, shoot, active shooter or some other incident happens where uh, law enforcement are needed. And so resolution three suggests can we solve this problem by asking or requiring the state to fund SROs in the highest need school districts where there isn't law enforcement nearby? Two different approaches to, in essence, the same challenge that rural school districts, school buildings face. Um, I think it's important that we discuss this one particular, uh, given our uh, political climate and whatnot, um, uh, in, the, in an open meeting. And so I put those out there. Any thoughts? Um, a couple thoughts, and, and we discussed this in reasonable length, I would say, at the legislative uh, meeting when we, did, when we went through this. Um, I think that it's almost looked, I think a lot of times um, people are a little bit uncomfortable when they talk about 
you know, giving a, a teacher the opportunity to be that gun carrying person in the school for, for the, the safety purposes, I think for a couple of reasons. First of all, that's a lot of responsibility on that teacher. And um, while it's a volunteered thing, you're not forcing anyone to do that. It's still, you're, you're placing a lot of responsibility there. And the idea that um, a gun in a school that is not, even if that person is, has training and is a, a FOID card holder and all of those things, the training that they're going to have is going to be much less significant, much less intensive than the training that a um, school resource officer would have, being there oftentimes, as you said, former law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think there's kind of the, the second option, the you know offering grants for the trained law enforcement officials is sort of viewed as sort of a compromise, I think, in my view anyway. I personally, as, as we discussed the legislative committee meeting, I am personally one to say that I don't, I, I support the idea of no guns in school. I, I think more guns leads to the more likelihood that there are going to be gun related incidents and violence. So if you more guns you have in a school, the more likelihood you're going to have a gun related incident, whether it's accidental by a student getting a hold of that gun, et cetera, et cetera. But I do see the compromise in having it be um, a trained law enforcement official for those districts where if they're in a very rural area and they have that long response time, I can understand that perspective um, and kind of can see the, the value in the compromise in that potential solution of having the grant proposals for um, trained law enforcement officials as opposed to allowing school boards the, the opportunity to allow teachers to carry guns in school. I agree, Emily. Um, again, just my, my previous statement, I believe, um, I believe in the concept of local control, I think that the seven of us can make the decisions about our community better than people in Springfield can. And I would, ex I would expect that the, the people in our community would want us to make those decisions locally rather than having them made for us. However, I, I did read number three the same way that you did, that that is a, a good compromise um, to um, number one. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if, as long as I'm on the board, I have no interest in ever seeing guns in our schools um, makes me nervous makes me you know I have, I have a high, high disdain for guns personally um, but you know given that what I just said I don't want to I don't want to be talking out of both ends of my mouth I do believe in local control but having three in there and, and not putting that position forward I feel okay about that a little bit of discussion came up about this last year and it, it, it did mm -hmm. angle around um, local control and I, and I think that the, the challenge in this is that we know that our community, we know what our resources look like and we know what our needs are. And I think it's easy for us to say that that's not a decision that we would make. And I think it's always, I think it was, in some ways it's hard to know that potentially you're putting a school district that doesn't have the same resources as ours potentially in harm's way because they don't have something to protect themselves. So I think that number three is a good approach there because my biggest challenge, I think, with arming individuals in the school that are not a designated law enforcement officer is I worry more along the line of, if that's a teacher, does that create, I'm not worried about accidentals and, and this as much as I am. Are we creating a boundary between that person and, and, their, and their students? Are we, are, we, are we just creating an atmosphere that, that isn't as conducive to learning? At the same time, I know that if you look at all the high schools that are around this area, they've got an armed officer in, in their schools and I think that they've got a plan um, to deal with any kind of situ situation that can arise and I'll tell you the schools utilize them not necessarily for active shooter but there are other things that they, that they do get involved in um, that, that really is beneficial to have somebody there representing law enforcement and so I, I think this is a probably the, the the smarter stance to take on, on making sure that we're trying to help get resources to areas that need them. And I think that this will be something that we're going to have to continue to monitor because um, I, I know that there, there are a lot of people that really support the idea of, of arming a, uh, an existing employee in the building and, and maybe there's a model in which that works. I just, I don't see it yet. And, but I think it's easy for me to relinquish local control on this one because I think that there is a decent alternative to it at this point that that's worth looking out looking at first um, ultimately to speak to your uh, point around student and teacher barriers that could be created or student and adult in a building barriers that could be created 
by arming an adult. Um, last year, Carrie invited uh, a couple of us into a classroom at Whittier, uh, where by happenstance around this time last year, uh, students were uh, allowed to pick their own project for a policy position that they wanted to create a project around. Uh, four out of the five student groups in that classroom picked a picked guns in schools as their policy to debate and discuss and provide a recommendation on. Uh, and almost every one of the groups that presented on that topic spoke to, in essence, that level of anxiety that they would have as a student. This is a fifth grade class, to right. be clear. Uh, level of anxiety that they might have as a student, knowing that either a gun is in the building or knowing that their teacher is the one that's being armed uh, and not knowing what the implications might be of them uh, being in harm's way because of an accidental situation or by one, one group shared uh, not being able to be honest with a teacher, not knowing what the consequences might be. Uh, and you, if you have fifth graders worrying about that level of potential action being taken in a building, uh, you can just imagine the level of anxiety if this is a now a new norm in buildings. Yeah. And so uh, I just wanted to echo that from, from our students' perspective. more comments on, on either of those resolutions. All right. You had number 10 as well. Number 10 is an interesting one. Uh, it's a proposal by a district on uh, compensating school board members. Uh, this is one that we as a committee decided to make a decision on before we threw it to the administration, uh, given that they are, uh, that, given that we manage them, it would be weird for them to say you should or should not be paid. Uh, <laughs> and so with that, uh, this one, uh, the approach that they take here is school board should be able to decide themselves whether they should be compensated. Um, I will pause there and open up the discussion. <laughs> that's fine, I would vote no. What's that? <laughs> said that's fine and I would vote no because that's the whole point of. Would you vote no that, yeah, what are you voting no on? The question of whether we, uh, as we'll a get, seven, would give ourselves compensation or whether or not I, IASB should put should not advance legislation or lobby for legislation that would give us the power to make that decision. Both. <laughs> that just that, for public service, that's just not for what we are asked to do. Um, I think the conflict of interest is extremely high, and in this state, with the history ever so recent and moving forward it's it's that's just silly it would cloud my judgment every time i made a vote i think you recommended no anyway right? we recommended yeah. no yeah. i think the one, committee yeah. kind of felt the same way you do jill that it's it's not necessarily it, it's not necessary that i think of, you know the overwhelming majority of people who look to do this what we're all doing are not doing it for compensation, we're doing it to help the community and help the students and, and that kind of thing, and that the potential conflict of interest or ethical dilemma that might occur with that is too far too great, <laughs> so. Well, and the interesting thing is, as far as local control, that is normally where I lean, and this is one of those that if for some reason they ever wanted to compensate a school board member, I think that that would be a number that would be determined at the state level and then passed down. Like, there's no reason for us to be deciding, oh, we should be. I, I don't think that. I don't think that that's a good place um, for us to be. I think that, again, all of us joined the school board, uh, understanding that that there was um, no paycheck uh, involved. So <laughs> I'm I'm comfortable with saying no on that on that resolution as well. Those are all the ones that I thought were were important to discuss. If there's any others from this group, can we just go back to? Um, so again, we're voting separately on 13. Is that correct? That's we'll we'll that. on and on the, the committee did not give a clear. Yes. It was a six-four split. Okay, and, the, and but, so it didn't feel like a convincing recommendation. The administration, though, has has made a recommendation, made a recommendation against it. Has made a recommendation to, to, to not support, support it. To support the position, which is to okay. now, now, now we're playing word games here. Yes. Yes. Support yeah. the position to to pay the repeal family. legislation yes. requiring a, a, a prevailing wage. So, so, so when you're voting on these, you're voting on the IESB's recommendation for or against. So in this particular one, number 13, the IESB's recommendation is to, in essence, repeal this language and give local control. Got it. Okay. 
So a vote for yes would be um, for repealing it. Okay. Okay. So a vote for yes, for yes is for repealing it. A vote okay. for no is to make, keep the law as is. Okay. okay. Vote wrong. for yes is to support the administration. So, so yes. that's, what, that's yes. a good question. So that's why I'm at. So, so the, I'm, um, if I say yes, I'm actually going. I'm going with what the administration is. The motion is to Correct. support okay. the the resolution. Okay. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> that's, I, I'm sorry. I got a little. Can you talk about it so yeah. much? I got a little. Confusing. Confusing. Yeah. How exactly yeah. do I like, want to vote? Yeah. Okay. Again, the easiest way to think about it is you're. You're yeah. voting on the it doesn't, ISP it doesn't matter. Resolution. resolution, yes. Right. Yes. But <laughs> to Steve's point, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. It does matter. It matters. It, it matters. doesn't matter. It matters for your, it matters for your principle anything. of your vote. <laughs> your vote is your principle and your so integrity. That, so we, it matters. We let you correct lead kind of sense uh, as, as leader committee. Did you have any? Um, <laughs> Emily, did you have any other points that no. you wanted to bring up from committee? No. Nope. Is there any other questions or discussion items? on any of the resolutions. No, thanks for being so thorough with that, though. I, I appreciate the insight into the discussion, because um, I think some of these, you know, to Greg's point, we kind of read through and kind of already had our personal conclusions, so I appreciate you bringing the discussion forward. And, and this is big news. I mean, last year at the WV Assembly, all the major news networks were there for yeah. number one. I mean, right. so yeah. this yeah. does get a lot of press coverage, and, and so it, it's nice to be able to have that broader conversation. It's very cool. likely that that will happen again this year because yep. the same issue is up for vote. Agreed. All right. So two votes. Right. Oh, but I can just do an all in favor. So just a just a reminder, we're, we're voting on um, supporting uh, the recommendations from both the administration and the IASB, um, and this will be for um, Karat to cast his vote in according uh, to these. And this is for all of them with the exception of Resolution 13. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the positions on each resolution in the 2019 Resolutions Committee Report as presented in the attached spreadsheet with the exception of Resolution Number 13 and direct IASB Delegate Karat Doshi to cast his vote accordingly on behalf of District 58. Next, is there a motion regarding resolution number 13? Um, and that one is. Uh, I read the Just keep you on your toes, Jim. <laughs> number 13 is <coughs> Statement 5.05, the Prevailing Wage Act. Um, is that. The motion is to support the resolution, number 13, and direct member Doshi to cast his vote accordingly on behalf of District 58. So let me say that again. This is resolution number 13, position statement 5.05, the Prevailing Wage Act, and the vote is to support the resolution number 13 and direct member Doshi to cast his vote accordingly on behalf of District 58. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion or further discussion? All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion carried to support resolution number 13 and direct member Doshi to cast his vote accordingly on behalf of District 58. Next up is the second reading of policies number uh, 1150, citizens' communication to the board, and number 8244, determining agenda as recommended by the policy committee. Is there a motion to approve revisions to the policy number 1150, citizens' communication to the board, and number 8244, determining agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? The one on citizen communication or community relations as it says in the policy, uh, is this one just about changing the name from reception of visitors to public comment? Yeah, it's our, our language around. Time yeah. What's the reason for that? The reason is um, right now, because you don't have a title public comment, you don't have the ability to limit. You can only suggest the amount of time an individual can make a public uh, comment. 
Now, even if you do adopt this, the board could still extend the, the minute setting policy, but right now you could have a, a, a situation where you could be here for hours and hours and hours. Um, so the, the intention of this policy is to, again, give the board a little bit more control. No one is recommending that you limit um, what citizens may be able to, to bring to you. But it's also, this came out of a, a board self-reflection. Right. I can't remember the timeline. It was with Carrie. Um, mm -hmm. It was maybe... January or earlier? It was or brought earlier? up after, I think, but the, it was, um, it was an IASB dinner in Naperville, mm -hmm. and they brought up all... But it was, it was about, um, you know, the board's frustration with, you know, this level of communication is not optimal for us. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, at that time, we said that we want to we be, be able to hear people and have some structure around it so like you said it doesn't get out of control but we also added other opportunities like our coffee and cookies before this meeting at, following that meeting and that discussion to make sure that we were engaging with with the community in ways that we could actually have a dialogue rather than just sitting here and listening um, and um, and you know if somebody takes the, the podium for 15 20 minutes and then there's 20 other people in the audience and they don't get a chance to speak. That's not really the best way for us to hear from everybody, but it's also not the best way for us to, to, to listen and to, um, to engage the stakeholders. So this is something that um, you know, we just think is, is, is one, of, one of the ways we, we um, engage with the community, but it's, it's just a part of a, of a, of a toolbox of, of strategies that we have. Well, it was also about language and the fact that this is not an opportunity for dialogue, so public comment is more reflected the expectation so that people realize that this was more of an opportunity for us to hear from them but not engage in dialogue where we call our extended reception visitors that we have at our um, uh, workshops. our workshops that's an opportunity that we can actually do some engagement back and forth so it was it was an opportunity to help us uh, bring a little clarity to that as well thank you right. any other discussion all right all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed Motion carried to approve the revisions to policies number 1150, Citizens Communication of the Board, and number 8244, Determining Agenda. Next up is the IASB Policy Manual Customization as recommended by the Policy Committee. Is there a motion to adopt the IASB Policy Manual via the policy customization process, subscribe to Press Plus, and implement the online policy manual? So moved. So moved. <laughs> second. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Uh, second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Simanti? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Motion carried to adopt the IESB policy manual via the policy customization process, subscribe to Press Plus, and implement the online policy manual. Uh, we got a couple of announcements here, uh, a couple dates to note. We got the district leadership team on Monday, November 18th at 3.45 p.m. at El Sierra. We have the staff meet and greet Monday, November 18th at 6.15 p.m. at El Sierra. And the Board of Education Financial Workshop on Monday, November 18th at 7 p.m. at El Sierra. We have a policy committee meeting on Tuesday, November 19th at 7 a.m. at the ASC and a legislative committee meeting on Wednesday, November 20th at 3.45 p.m. at the ASC and Lester's PTA and building tour on Wednesday, November 20th at 6.30 p.m. at Lester School. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or a semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion, uh, motion carried. The board will now meet in closed session after a short recess. We meet at 9.40 p.m.